Okay, I'm going to do the roll call first, please. I'm going to open the meeting up. I'm going to do a roll call first for Mr. Beto. Mr. Decker? Yes. Uh, Ms. Felton is here. Here. Mr. Sokolowski is here. Yes. I am here. Alex is like, here. I feel yep. like you just, yeah. And Mr. Stavarsky is here. I am here. And Mr. Potter is here. I'm here. So we got a full venue. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't yes. know if this is a new hearing or a continuation of an old one that I might not have been on. Um, this is a continue. Well, I shouldn't say it's a continuation. There's a new this is a new filing. Am I correct, Jen? This is a new filing. Okay. With new information. But I think in answer to your question, John, I think Deerfield Academy might be a, a, a butter here. So I don't know whether you want to participate or not. Oh, I, so I was not planning on doing this. I did not know they were in a butter. So no. uh, I knew there was no, a reason sorry. I wasn't doing this. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. I cannot I cannot appear on this one. So. Okay, thank you. I'm conflicted. Uh, we are <coughs> opening a public hearing on the application of Charles Beto for a special permit for the construction of a 15 by 20 addition to a non-conforming lot lacking frontage in and the square footage requirement located on 117 Old Main Street, Assessor's Map 49, Lot 17. Hi, I guess I'll start talking. This is Guy Ardry. Um, my wife and I are the owners of the property. Charles Beto filed this for us. He's been helping us with this process. Um, hi everyone, and thanks for taking the time tonight. Um, my wife is, you know, we've appeared before for you know, different variations, but um, in general, my wife and I are hoping to rebuild our uh, a garage on its current footprint, but also add an addition off the back of it. The main reason is to uh, expand the space so our kids can have bigger bedrooms. They've got really small bedrooms right now, and they've grown up on us. So we're hoping to get them um, to make that addition. Um, the, uh, what's happened is that uh, apparently our, um, our lot is non-conforming um, based on frontage and square footage requirements. So we're asking for a special permit to, I guess, relief from those, um, those requirements. Um, the, um, the argument that we would make is that um, the, uh, and actually, Jen, do you happen to have that document? We don't have to go to it quite yet. Just making sure you got it. Um, thank you so much. Um, but, um, the argument we would make is that we, um, um, it's, uh, very, very minimal impact, um, on the surrounding area. Um, so we would appeal to subsection 2254 of the uh, zoning bylaws, um, that the Board of Appeals may, by special permit, allow such reconstruction, extension, alteration, or chat or change, where it determines that the proposed modification will not be substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming structure to the neighborhood. So I've um, included a document that it just has pictures on it. It's the, the survey of the of the property. Um, it's a satellite photo, and then it's some pictures that I took recently, just to show you. Um, how little of an impact this would have on the surrounding areas and um, essentially no impact on views to our neighbors. Um, so uh, would it be okay to look at that document now? Bernie, can I share it? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, can you see it? Not yet. Uh here it comes. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Jen. Um, so the um, so that's our survey plot. As you can see, it's a flag lot. So I think that's the reason why we don't uh, fulfill the um, frontage requirements. Um, and um, the uh, the garage is on the far left side of the structure. Um, and again, it would be the existing footprint and then it would also, um, a portion of that existing footprint would also go back about 20 feet, uh, 21 feet actually. 
Um, the, uh, Jen, do you mind going back to the satellite photo? Thanks. Um, so the blue dot is where the house is. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's, there's the houses, our neighbors are, uh, are pretty far away. It's a sort of a big open field that surrounds most of the house. Um, and uh, you can see that we're set, set pretty far back off of Old Main Street, uh, where the frontage requirements would have been. Um, thanks, Jen. You can go to the next one. Um, so the, the picture on the top left is the view from the street. Um, the house to the right is owned by Deerfield Academy. The uh, house to the left is owned by, uh, it's where the head of historic Deerfield lives. Uh, it's owned by historic Deerfield. Um, so our property is at the end of that driveway. Um, so as you can see from the, from the, from the, from the street, there's, you can't even see the house. Um, in all fairness, in, in the middle of the winter, you can barely see it when the leaves are all down. Um, and that's what the house look, just below that picture is, is what the house looks like. Uh, you can see the, the shed garage off the left. So basically from this viewpoint, we would uh, rebuild um, that portion and then extend it further, a little part of it um, further back than the existing footprint. Um, so the picture from the, uh, can you go up a little bit, Jen? Thanks. The picture on the top right is uh, sort of the, a view from uh, the yard of the, the historic Deerfield house, uh, looking back at it. So it's pretty obscured by trees already. Um, the, um, and by the way, we've discussed this with historic Deerfield and they actually are, are encouraging this. They think it would look better, frankly. Um, to have a, a more appealing structure there. So we haven't had any complaints from them. Um, the picture below that is from the, the south side. Um, that's the view from the barn of the Yaswinski farm. Um, so it's, that's not even from the Yaswinski residence, it's just from the, the barn. That would be the only prospect that would uh, see a, a larger structure would be that. Um, Okay, Jen, you can go to the next one. And then these pictures are just from, um, the ones on the left are just from the, uh, from the yard looking at just sort of showing that uh, all the space that's, uh, that's around it. Um, and then the, uh, the pictures on the right, I don't know if you can see it well enough, but the, uh, I put some cones out, some orange cones in the approximate dimensions of um, where the addition coming off the back of the, the, the original footprint garage would be. Um, so uh, anyway, that's just the uh, logistics of it. So just wanted to uh, show you the setting of it um, and, uh, and, a, and a appeal to your discretion as far as um, the fact that it does not substantially, uh, it's not substantially more detrimental um, than the existing non-conforming structure to the neighborhood. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I have. Do you want me to um, stop screen sharing or does anybody have comments on these images? Open to comments by board members, please. My only question is, is it any closer to the property line than what's existing today? No, uh, the addition meets the setback requirements. Okay, because there was previously a permit issued on that side of the house also, wasn't there? Well, we were initially trying to get relief from a setback, but we, we scrapped that and then redesigned the addition to meet the setback requirements. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by board members? How many stories is the addition? Uh, two stories. Ground floor and then one above. So is the roof line on the second story going to be visible from the front of the house then now? 
the roof line of the second story. You'll see it. Yes, you know, the, 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 the front of the house will have, it'll have two. The idea is to make it sort of look like a, a barn shape, sort of a triangular top above the, above the first floor. Uh, but the, uh, the roof line would be pretty much the same height as the existing roof line of the rest of the house. I think maybe a foot or two higher. A foot or two higher. And is your existing garage coming down? Yes, yes. We would demolish the existing garage and rebuild that on its footprint. As a garage with living space above it? Yes. Any uh, input back? I didn't see anything from Historic Deerfield this time around. Um, I have a raised hand in the comment section. I have a question. How much more, how many more square foot footage are you going to add to your house as it is right now? Uh, I'm not sure. Charles, are you available to answer that? Do you happen to know? Well, what size is the of the addition is it going to be? The, uh, could you give me one second and I will, I can answer that question. Well, it would be uh, double the size of the existing garage because the existing garage is one floor. Um, and then the back half of the addition is approximately 21 feet by 15 feet. Um, so over two stories. If I could comment on that, I mean, I will issue a permit for the existing footprint of the garage going up. It's strictly just the new footprint that is the, where the nonconformity comes in. Thanks, Bob. Um, the the new the square footage of the new addition is is two hundred and sixty four square feet. Hang on, hang, I have a question. Hang on for a second. I'm looking for some something right on. So the the, the new addition is two sixty four. Yes, and it's actually it's a. Um, It is uh, uh, a story and a, uh, it's a story and a half. In other words, the second floor is not a full, a full um, second floor. It's a story and a half. So it has short walls on the second floor. The idea being we keep the, as Guy pointed out, we keep the roof lines relatively consistent with the, with the existing house. Uh, second, I want to, I was, my, uh, speaker is not very loud so it's hard for me to hear some of this on the existing garage you're going to rip it down yes okay so that's going to become living space that's the second floor of it is yes the first no, floor no, wait a minute garage. is it are you ripping it down and putting in additional space or you're ripping it down and keeping it as a garage you're um, i'm getting a miss i'm so not guess, really yes okay well, we're, we're tearing it down but hang on a second Okay, that's better. Okay, so the yeah, garage is- we're, we're tearing it down and putting, red, and putting living space above it. And is it gonna stay a garage? The, the first floor of it is, yes. So you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna still be a garage, yes. but you're gonna put a second floor on it. Yes. Okay, and then you're gonna put an addition on the back? Correct. Which is a story and a half. Correct. With 260 square feet. I'm not sure about that exact number. Well, that's but, what yes. Mr. Beto said. Yes, okay. well, it's, uh, it's 264 square feet is the footprint. And so, but it's two stories. Of, this is the new addition I'm talking about. Um, so combined, you know, the, the, you know the, um, the total combined new, new addition space would be, um, 528. 528, thank you. 528 square feet. 
Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Any other questions? Uh, Jen. Um, I have somebody from the public that has a question. Uh, he says that, let's see. Yes, yeah, so I am entertain, uh, entertaining it. Go ahead, let him, let him ask. It's it. okay. Okay. Yep. Um, Phil Z, I think. Z Phil Z from Historic yeah. Deerfield. Yes, please. Correct. Yeah, um, he says we have concerns about the closeness of the construction to the property line, which is only four to five feet away. I can, he says he's having technical difficulties, but I'll see if I can promote him. Okay. Phil, are you able to hear us? He appears to be muted. Yeah, I just asked him to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to be only uh, here by voice. Um, yeah, Historic Deerfield um, is, uh, we're good neighbors uh, of the Andres and, and all that. And I'm, I'm actually the occupant of Historic Deerfield's uh, house. But the, the point is it's Historic Deerfield's and not mine. And uh, Historic Deerfield does have some concern about uh, the construction uh, and its placement so close to the property line, which is only four to five feet away. It's on a slight angle. So, um, so there is an issue there. And I guess one piece of that is um, not, not just the, the visual part, but uh, con any construction or any, any maintenance of the building probably has to involve um, our property because of the closeness of the line. In other words, there's barely room for a lawnmower to get uh, through there, let alone uh, ladders and so on and so forth over time. So I just want to share that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex, are you there? Person Rodder, is, uh, Alex, are you there? Yeah, yeah okay. sorry, I'm, 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 I'm eating dinner. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. okay, because I saw your shut off. I was. Concerned we didn't have enough of votes. No, no, okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm okay. here. Any other questions from board members? Uh, may I just say one last thing, uh, just in response yes. to Mr. Zay's comments. We, we did um, ask Historic Deerfield if we could purchase five feet of land um, to alleviate that issue, but they said no. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? My only question is <clears throat> the uh, applicant can get around to the back side of his house on the other side without going on anybody else's property. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So we're not, you're not encroaching any further onto historic Deerfield's property than what currently exists under a current special permit. Am I correct? As far as I know, yes. Okay. Thank you. I think the entire house is four feet away from their property, Bob. So uh, the encroachment goes straight back off your existing structure, Mr. Audrey? Well, the the addition off the back is, is set back to meet the 10 foot setback requirements. So the only thing that would be built within four feet of the property line is what's the existing footprint of what's already there. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, yeah. Yes, Alex? Uh, just a side note, uh, Mr. Audrey, I appreciate the uh, visuals. Um, uh, it's, it's nice and easy for me to see things and I also appreciate the, the cone placement, just so you can get an idea of where things are. Um, I'm a visual person and anything helps, so thank you. Sure. Okay, any other comments? Maybe close comments. Okay, so we're going to end public comment. We're going to go to deliberation. So that means no comments by anybody. Okay, you can't ask questions now. All right, do I have a second for that? You made a motion to close. I'll second it. Okay. Well, all right, let's take a vote on that. Ms. Felton? Yes. <clears throat> I. Agree, close, Mr. Decker, close discussion. Yes. End discussion, I'm sorry, end discussion. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. And Alex. Yes. 
So we got our five, we got our five. Okay. Now we're going to go into deliberation, please. So comments and deliberation on the um, appeal or request. I'm sorry, request. All right. If we have no discussion, do I have a motion to move to vote? Yes. Oh, second? Seconded. Second. Okay, so we're going to do a roll call of vote. <coughs> You're going to have to bear with me because the papers, <coughs> the papers they gave me with the um, recording of votes are not up to date with chair members names. We had that same problem last month. They're going to have to get that straight away. Well, I straightened it out as best I could. Uh, question, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I believe that uh, if this permit is going to be granted, the board is going to have to make a finding. Okay? Yep. Okay. I'm trying to read off what we got here. We have to have a hardship finding still, Mr. Decker, right? No. No. That it was just not necessarily. Not on a special permit. There's a special permit now. Last time they were here for a variance. Yeah, there's no hardship necessary for this. So you're asking us to vary the existing zoning laws. Is that correct? Everyone understand that? Yes. You're asking for a variance. No. A special permit. They're okay. asking for a special permit. Okay. So that does not, it doesn't necessarily require the hardship, but it could, it could require a hardship. Yeah, we have to, the board has to make a finding that right. it's not any more detrimental to the neighborhood. Right. Okay. Miss Felton. I vote in favor of granting the special permit. Okay. That's a yes vote. Miss Felton's a yes. Uh, Mr. Decker. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. I'm going to abstain based on the comments of the of butter. Alex. Yes. And I vote no. So that's three to uh, one. I believe that does not pass. It's not accepted. Am I correct? You certainly are. Okay. This um, appeal for a special. I, I would also just to let um, you know, Mr. Audrey, know there's a lot of people in the same situation that you are, and uh, you know you should petition the planning board to address these buildings on non-conforming lots. Can I, can I respectfully ask you to not abstain and to no, register? No, that's, that's my vote. I'm going to abstain, but um, I just, I want you to know that there's other people in your position and I feel your pain, but based on the abutter's comments, I'm going to abstain. And I think that this issue should be brought in front of the planning board and they should correct the law. <clears throat> So it's denied. So that's two years without uh, a reappeal, unless the planning board changes the law. Unless the change, planning board changes the law, and and I'm going to agree with Mr. Sokolowski. These are issues to deal with. What we we're following the law the best we can, and I think you're you're not the only one. Unfortunately, and maybe things will change. I hope that they do. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take a. We take a three minute break so I can go to the bathroom and then we're gonna open up with um, Family Dollar. I'm sorry, the applicant. You're not gonna go out for pizza? <laughs> I don't even know where I am half the time. Go see. <laughs> okay, I'm back on. Mr. Decker's here. Yes. Um, Adam Sokolowski. He's here. Yes, yes, yep. Alex. Yep. John Saberski. Yep. And David Potter. Here. Okay. If I can just find 
Okay, this is a continuation public hearing. South Deerfield application. Project proposed development through the construction of a 9,319 foot square building, retail building with the association improvements with the property located on Mill Village Road, lot 120, 132, 2930. A special permit is requested for the proposed retail use in the commercial C11 district under the standard section 5300. Okay. Um, I believe we left off to cover 5324, 5325, and 5326. Am I correct? We've covered the first three, 5121, 5322, and 5323. Um, I would like to have here, if we have any, um, good afternoon, Mr. Costa. Thank you for being here. Smile. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have representation from uh, the application? Mr. Donahue, are you speaking for the applicant? I am, Mr. Chairman. Mark Donahue, on behalf of the applicant. At okay. the near the one, closing. One, one quick thing. Um, sure. I want to go through this because we sometimes forget. Since we have to write this down in a minutes, please state your name so we know who is speaking when you address the chair, please, and run it through the chair so we keep this as an orderly meeting so we don't get into side issues. But thank you. I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I have to remind myself of this. So I'm sorry, Mr. Donahue. No concerns, Mr. Chairman. Uh, once again, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. Near the end of the meeting uh, on uh, October 8th, um, the applicant was asked to articulate in a clearer fashion the benefits of the proposed development consistent with Section 5300 of the Zoning Bylaw. And we submitted a correspondence yesterday to the board to that point. And with your permission, I'd just like to touch on that um, briefly um, as the board goes into its further deliberation. <clears throat> um, to do that, what I, what I think it's important to kind of keep focus and not get lost in the specific language of your zoning bylaw, um, but to remember what the purpose of a special permit is. Um, and it really is to recognize uh, certain uses which cannot be trusted, for lack of a better term, to simply be permitted as of right in the district, nor are they so obnoxious as to be prohibited, but they, it's basically a use that might be appropriate within a particular zone, um, but not necessarily compatible with all parts of that zone. Um, so you have to look at the surrounding area and all the impacts of, of that, for example, um, and there's certain uses that your bylaw identifies for that your bylaw kind of creates this weighing of benefits versus detriments. Um, but because it is a special permitted use, it is, it, it's not a grounds for denial, simply that one is seeking a special permit, in this case for a building larger than is permitted as of right for the retail use. You have to look at that proposed use, the proposed larger building in the context of its location, its impact on the surrounding area, and its particular design that tries to ameliorate those concerns. That is particularly hard to do in a case where the, the zone where the use is permitted, here the commercial two zone, abuts an active uh, zone where you have a use that basically inherently conflicts with it. And by that I mean much of the discussion has related on the impact on the residential neighborhood that abuts the property. One needs to recognize that this property in question cannot be used for residential purposes. And conversely, a commercial use such as proposed can't go in a residential use. So in looking at that, there's this inter internal conflict that exists that's always going to, to be there. And as a result, I think the board respectfully needs to consider it's not the burden of the applicant to demonstrate that there's no detriment. Rather, it's, a de it's an obligation on the weighing process to show that the potential detriments have been responded to by the applicant. And that's how you try to figure out in proximity how it would work. This site, by way of example, would be inappropriate for use, some uses that are in the commercial two zone simply because of its proximity and openness to the residential neighborhood. By way of example, 
Um, if the applicant were coming in to do a gasoline service station uh, or, um, or with a convenience store, this is, I suggest to you, a wholly inappropriate place for that because you're creating too much conflict in that case. But there's always going to be some conflict when you use a vacant pastoral piece of land that people look out their kitchen window or their living room window at and get to enjoy that in some fashion. Um, but we suggest that this use still has certain benefits and particularly benefits to that conf conflict with the residential use because of the minimum impact it has on that. The benefits that we outlined in the letter just to highlight relate to a, a few different things. For more than 10 years, Mass DOT and, and the town of Deerfield have recognized the need for traffic improvements at the intersection uh, that we have spoken so much about. There is no effort underway to get those done absent this development. This development gets those necessary safety improvements that affect much more than just the immediate neighborhood completed, which is certainly a benefit to the neighborhood and certainly a benefit to the town. It is an appropriate type of commercial use in the commercial district. And the way I think that, as I suggested in the letter, one can look at that is by comparing it to an as of right use in the commercial district and how that could be used uh, under your zoning bylaw. And I think it's very instructive when you do that and you say that the, the, the site could be used by way of example for a manufacturing processing um, fabrication facility, provided it meets certain performance standards. And your section 4900 of the bylaw sets forth very specifically those performance standards. The traffic that can be generated under that performance standard as a matter of right for commercial use is less than the projected traffic that has been submitted to this board, peer reviewed through the planning board process and the like. The hours of operation are less. The ability to emit sound from the site and at the property line is less here than would be permitted under an as of right use. And I think that is a benefit because the benefit is an appropriate use of commercial property if one accepts the premise that vacant land is not going to remain vacant ever in a fashion that has even less impact than an as of right commercial use could have under the particular fashion. That's particularly true here, where in addition to simply the use, the design of the site has been taken into consideration its proximity to the residential areas. This site has been developed with not one, but two active, aggressive visual buffers. The landscaping buffer that we reviewed in some detail and the stockade fence that's inside the property line that was requested and made part of the development all the way along. It has all the appropriate down lighting and lighting is a, quite a distance from any of the property lines. The building far exceeds the setback requirements near the side yard or rear yard as it gets to be the button zone. And it creates much less impervious area than would be otherwise be permitted. We say that the, the site has certain benefits in the use because it does provide needed retail in town. It is not accurate to say there's enough places to shop in Deerfield. Deerfield would benefit from additional retail outlets, the, the competition that brings to the entire marketplace in pricing, and employment. So those are the benefits. As you go through your deliberation, and as it started last meeting, um, one of the issues is neighborhood character and social structure. And I just want to touch on that, because I think it's important to recognize, as I said before, the uniqueness of this. It is unfair, I suggest, to suggest that this development needs to be similar in character to the abutting residential use or residential zone. And the reason is, is because this site can't be used for residential purposes. So it's going to be used for some purpose that is going to be different from that. What I suggest the neighborhood character has to be is, is a two level analysis by the board. One is, is it consistent in size, scope and impact to other commercial uses in the commercial corridor along the state highway? And I think the answer to that is yes for all the evidence we've submitted. It's far smaller than other buildings this board's permitted or that exist out there. And second, does it properly recognize the conflict it creates because of the physical characteristics of the site in its abutting adjoining residential area? 
And once again, reflecting upon the, bu the buffering that's there, the limited, in fact, non-existent exterior use, the limited, in fact, non-existent except for vehicle traffic, noise that emanates from the site, it, it is consistent with the fact that this site is going to be used for a commercial activity of some kind um, and therefore is an appropriate use for that. So we believe we've met our burden. That is not to suggest that somebody will not have a deleterious impact as a result of the development of this site outside their window. We recognize that. We think we've ameliorated it through the design, uh, but we think that the, overall we've met the burden and requirements of your bylaw for the grant of a special permit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, this is uh, John Staberski, and uh, I read uh, Mr. Donahue's letter this morning, and, uh, and I had a couple of sentences that I was wondering if they were uh, correct statements of our bylaws and law and forwarded them uh, to our attorney today. I didn't ask for his opinion. I just said I was going to ask him about those couple of sentences. Since Mr. Donahue had talked about his letter, uh, would it be appropriate time to ask Mr. Costa for his opinion on those? I, Mr. Costa, would you like to um, well, uh, answer those questions? Could Mr. Staworski, could you uh, tell us which ones you're referring to, please. And, yeah, and what was, letter? Uh, so, which, I'm sorry, which letter are we talking about? So, Mr. Potter, today, uh, early, in, I got a probably maybe 9, 9.30, uh, a letter that uh, Mr. Donahue had sent to Mr. Sadowski. Um, Who that, sent it? Uh, Mr. Donahue sent it to Mr. Sadowski, and then it was forwarded by uh, the, the, the personnel at the town. To us. Okay, I don't think I received it. That's that's why I'm speaking up. I'm sorry no, to interrupt. You should have it. You should. That's an important letter. I, uh, I received it about nine o'clock as well. Mr. Decker, did you receive it? Yes, I got it here though. Was it from I, Jennifer or ATA? Which email? I think was it may have been from Sue. It's not. It ATA is Jennifer, so I'm. This is oh, the town administrator, sorry. but um, it would have come from Sue. I forwarded that email to. Could uh, someone please forward? Okay, hang on, letter. hang on, David. Hang on a second, Alex. Did you get yours? Yes. Okay, that's why I want Mrs. Staberski to read this section, please. First, and, since, and he, maybe, since you, John, you got the floor, so you have to. You, you asked to go through this. Let's do this step by step. So read this section, please. Unfortunately, David, you don't have one, but. John's got the floor here. So John, go to the section that you got so uh, Mr. Costa can respond. So so maybe I would suggest that if somebody has that letter, if they could forward it to Thank Mr. You. Potter while we're uh, okay. while we're talking about this. So he might be able to peruse it while we're, while we're discussing it. Um, as I was reading this, there were a couple of uh, sentences that jumped out at me. And it seemed as though Mr. Donahue was basing his evaluation what I suspected might not be an appropriate premise, and that is the standards that we're supposed to make our decision on. So the sentence I am talking about appears in the second paragraph. It's the last sentence. Uh, and so I'm, I'll read it out loud. And, and so for the, for the benefit of the, of the public, the sentence reads, the obligation of the board, however, is not to only approve developments that demonstrate absolutely no detrimental impacts. Rather, and this is the part that's, that's uh, of note, it is the balance of the benefit of the fact that a property owner is entitled to use its land in conjunction with the benefits for the town as a whole against the detrimental impacts upon the immediate neighborhood. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Costa, I thought that might have misstated our standards and, and law, and I, and I wanted to, because the rest of the letter was premised on, on that presumption. Um, so I wanted to get your, your sense of that. So um, through you, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yes, Adam. 
So, um, so I don't know that it misstates it, but I think to some extent, maybe it overstates it. And so I, I've got the benefit, um, as Mr. Zabersky, uh, you, in, you indicated a bit earlier, you forwarded the question to me earlier in the day today um, to, to tell me that you'd be asking it. So it gave me an opportunity, and I appreciate that, to dig up some memos I've written in the past to provide guidance because it's always better to, to sort of quote oneself in writing as opposed to trying to, to do it off the cuff um, and maybe, maybe then have the ability to do it more eloquently. So I, I dug around and I found some, some opinions I've written, guidance documents I've provided to other boards I've represented, and in a few cases to some private clients I've represented to uh, discuss and explain and, and, and um, elaborate on the special permit standard as it exists in the statute and then as it exists in different communities. Because the statute in Massachusetts, Chapter 48, Section 9, provides a framework. And then each community in Massachusetts and its zoning ordinance or bylaw provides greater specificity. And that's what is in, envisioned by the Zoning Act, that there will be more specific standards adopted community to community. So I've got a few things in front of me now, but maybe the most important thing I've got and where to start is the language of your zoning bylaw. So you've heard a lot of references. In fact, the chairman's already referenced sections 5321 through 5326, those six factors that you began discussing at the last session of the public hearing. And so section 5320, of which those six factors are a part, um, lays out the standard. And the language of that, and I'm just going to read it verbatim because it's important, it's the standard you're being asked to apply in this instance, is that a special permit may be granted by the special permit granting authority upon a written determination that the benefits of the proposed use outweigh the detrimental impacts on the town and the neighborhood. And then it goes on to say that that's in view of the particular characteristics of the site and of the proposal in relation to that site. And then it says that you can consider various criteria in making that determination. And it goes on to identify the six criteria that you've spent some time discussing. So, I agree with uh, Attorney Donahue's statement that it is a balancing test of sorts. I mean, the, your own bylaw uses the term outweigh. Where I think it maybe overstates the case a bit is when it uses the word entitled or entitlement. And I think we need to be very clear that no applicant is entitled in any way. And I don't know that this is what Attorney Donahue is saying. I don't think it is exactly. But certainly, I think he would concede that no applicant is entitled to a, a special permit. Special permits, unlike other forms of relief, like site plan approval, for example, special permits are discretionary. And special permit granting authorities have a great degree of discretion in applying a standard like this, uh, this test of weighing the benefits against the detriments, applying the six factors that are in your bylaw. Special permit granting authorities, like your zoning board, have a great deal of discretion in fulfilling that task. And so if you read through the dozens and dozens of cases, and there are dozens of them that address the special permit standard and how it has um, uh, uh, been, been explained by the courts over the course of the better part of 50 or 60 years, you can, you can certainly read quotes that you could use to your advantage depending upon which side of the argument you're on. So, you know, I've got a couple of cases here that I quoted in a brief not too long ago that talks about you know, quote, the board may not refuse to issue a permit for reasons unrelated to the standards of the bylaw for the exercise of its judgment. So that's a reminder that you need to be looking to that, that balancing test. You need to be looking to the six standards in your bylaw in determining whether a permit should or shouldn't be granted. And in fact, the case I cited here, uh, which was out of, uh, out of the town of Dover, went on to talk about examples of um, weighing the character or, rep or reputation of the applicant or the identity of the applicant and using that as a basis for denying the permit or considering prior zoning violations by that applicant in the community and using that as a basis. Those sorts of things are unrelated to the criteria in the bylaw and those obviously wouldn't be supported as a basis for denying a special permit. The flip side to that and when you go on and you read other cases is that these other cases support the premise that you're not obligated to grant a special permit. And so, um, for example, there's a case out of Duxbury, it's 50 years old at this point, that says that neither the Zoning Act nor any town's bylaw or ordinance gives an applicant an absolute right to a special permit. The board is not compelled to grant a special permit. It has discretionary power in granting a special permit. And in fact, 
there's a case a few years later that went on to say that the mere fact that the standards in a bylaw have been complied with doesn't even obligate the board to grant the special permit, that a board can deny a special permit even in a circumstance where it might have been able to grant it based upon compliance with those standards if it just doesn't believe that the balancing test overall or the test that's set forth in the bylaw has been satisfied. So that's a very lengthy answer to your question, Mr. Staberski, but I don't think that the applicant or the applicant's counsel, uh, Attorney Donahue, is misrepresenting the standard per se. It is, it is a question of whether the, the, the benefits outweigh the detriments, and it doesn't say that there can be no detriments whatsoever, but it is a balancing test of sorts. Um, but the fact that um, his argument or his client's position is that the, 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 the balance weighs in favor of the applicant um, doesn't obligate the board, of course, to come to reach that same conclusion. You have to apply that test and the six standards that are in your bylaw that are meant to guide you, one, two, three, four, five, six, and come to your own conclusion. Thank you. There is one other sentence, um, and it was the uh, on the page four. It's the first sentence in the last paragraph, and I'll read it again. Uh, Mr. John, could you tell us what paragraph that is, please? Okay. It is on page four. It's the last paragraph, and it's the first sentence in the last paragraph. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it reads, in closing, the applicant has demonstrated that there are significant material benefits to development uh, to the town as a whole when juxtaposed against the potential commercial development so close to residential properties. It's a desired use. Um, and then it goes on to say the only detriment and of any meaning, well, I'll strike, that's, that's the sentence. Uh, Mr. Costa, did you have any, any thoughts on, uh, on that sentence as, as to whether that is consistent with our bylaw and state law? Uh, so, so I do, and again, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, something that was said, and it was said, I think maybe in the first or second, I think it was the first session of the public hearing on this project back, back when we were having meetings live. And, I remember that I had an opportunity to respond to it. It was toward the latter part of the meeting. Um, it, there, was a, there was a statement made that, you know, it's the obligation of the board, and I'm obviously paraphrasing, maybe it wasn't stated, you know, quite, quite so explicitly, but that it's the obligation of the board or the task with which the, the, the board is faced to compare the facility that's proposed to what could be built there as of right. Because we know that you can build commercial on this site as of right, at least for zoning purposes, I'm not going to speak to other permits or approvals that might be required and whether those are achievable. But there are there is the, the potential to build as of right on this site um, from, a, from a strictly zoning perspective. Um, and I, I think at the time, um, and, and maybe, I, maybe I did speak more eloquently on the spot than I'm about to, but at the time I sort of reminded the board that, you know, if you look to your zoning bylaw and your uh, use regulations. You have a, a table of use regulations, as many municipalities do. And under commercial uses, you have um, different, different uh, rows for different types of commercial uses. And so you've got one row, one category of commercial use, and I'm looking at it here, that says retail sales or rental with or without display outdoors, dash, building 4,000 square feet or less of enclosed floor area. And then just beneath it, you have a separate category entirely for retail sales or rental with or without display outdoors dash ah. greater than 4,000 square feet up to 30,000 square feet of enclosed floor area. And in fact, you have a third one that goes from 30 to 60. And so I think that the, the position of the applicant or at least what was suggested to the board is that you ought to be considering the fact that you could, the applicant could build a smaller commercial building on this site. And so when you look at the effects of the proposed use, you need to compare it to what could be done there as of right. And I don't know that that's entirely true. I, I'm not discouraging the board or saying that it would be inappropriate when you apply these six factors or six criteria I'm not suggesting it would be inappropriate to consider the reality that this site is zoned non-residential, that it's zoned for certain commercial uses. And to consider what commercial uses could be built there as of right, and for that to, um, to sort of 
uh, uh, color your view of what would or would not be consistent with neighborhood character, for example, just to cite to one of the standards. But I don't think it's a strict comparison one to the other. I don't think you take the traffic that would be generated by a 4,000 square foot building and you take the traffic that would be generated by the proposed structure, you subtract one traffic count from the other and that's what you're stuck looking at. I don't think it's quite that simple. It is a whole separate category requires a special permit and that's what <coughs> if the applicant wants to make application for a building permit for a building of 4,000 square feet or less, they can do that. They haven't done that. The application is, is for a use that requires a special permit and you're, in, you're entitled to look at that entire use and not confined to comparing it to what else could potentially be there as of right. Again, not saying that that isn't something that can in any way color your view of the project as a whole. I think it can, and, and some of you might argue that it should, and that's up to you. But I, I hope that sort of addresses um, your question, Mr. Stavarsky. Thank you, it does. Uh, any other com or questions? Uh, David, oh, David had his hand up first, please. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Um, I wanted to address David, this. David, please state names so we can, re it has to go on the record, so we have to have uh, names. Sure, uh, David Potter, uh, board member. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of points brought up in the last few minutes. Um, one is uh, continuing with the point that Mr. Costa was just uh, uh, um, articulating. Um, I think while he is of course correct in saying that we're not limited in, we, we, we can consider the potential other uses as a comparison without weighing benefits and detriments, the specific language of our bylaw says something very different. And it's, um, it says exactly the opposite of what Mr. Donahue was trying to lead us to believe, in which he wants us to compare what they're proposing <coughs> to some uh, vague potential worse situation in the future. But our bylaw reads, 5320 says that um, we may grant the special permit after determining that benefits of the proposed use outweigh its detrimental impacts on the town and the neighborhood, not anybody else's. We are not charged by this bylaw or expected to compare this proposed use to any other possible use. That's exactly what it doesn't say. It says we're supposed to compare their proposal, the benefits of it with its um, detrimental impacts. So I just wanted to be really clear on that. And the other point that I wanted to make is that um, the corridor, he continually tries to define for us um, and I don't think that it's his purview to tell us what is the neighborhood um, and to use a definition of the corridor, which is convenient to his purposes. Um, and um, I also feel that he's trying to say with his point about uh, competition, that that is um, um, uh, fundamentally a benefit that just because another store is coming into town, that competition is a good thing. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of nuances there and um, uh, you know, he, he, he intends to portray things very um, uh, explicitly towards uh, a viewpoint that benefits his client. That's all for the moment, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Potter, anyone else? Can I just respond at some point, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Now okay? Yes, Mark Donahue, go ahead. Thank you, Mark Donahue, on behalf of the applicant. Um, uh, let me first clarify, I, I don't disagree with attorney costs in any fashion, and I, I didn't mean to suggest that somehow the owner or the applicant are entitled to a special permit. Um, but I, I do think it goes to the point of comparative use because the owner of the property is entitled to use his property in some fashion. Um, uh, there are uses under zoning, and let's just limit ourselves to zoning because we're at the Zoning Board of Appeals, that are permitted as of right, and he wouldn't have to come and prove in those cases this balancing act. 
And I think that's important, particularly given the specificity of your bylaw on certain points. So for the, the fact, by way of example, that section 5322 talks about traffic flow and safety, and if this board were inclined uh, coming from this development, I think it is important for the board to take a step back and, point, and look at the fact that under your bylaw as written, there are certain performance standards that an, a manufacturing use could provide that meet certain traffic that exceed the traffic anticipated to be generated from here. So I think it's an important fact. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it is the litmus test for lack of a better term as to whether we should be granted or not. But I think that it helps recognize that there are other uses that the land will be put to. So when one is considering what the detriments are, the simple fact that you are building a building on a lovely piece of vacant land is not, I suggest, enough of a detriment. Thank you, Attorney. Anyone else for comments? I have a question for Mr. Costa. Hang on a second, Adam. Um, you said that this can only be developed a certain way, correct? Are there, are there federal laws that supersede local zoning acts that can put this land to, dif to different uses without control of local um, zoning laws, participation, or whatever you want to call it. Just a yes or no answer. I don't want to go into detail. Just is it, are there laws, is there federal laws where this can be used without the zoning board or the town um, any controls? Um, so Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure I can give you a simple yes or no answer because if you force my hand on it, I think the answer would have to be generally no. So zoning, zoning law in Massachusetts under the Home Rule Amendment has been left to municipalities. Now there are always exceptions to the rule. The state has stepped in and said that certain types of uses like religious uses or educational uses can't be, can't be uh, uh, over-regulated by municipalities or restricted or prohibited by municipalities. Similarly, the federal government has certain powers eminent domain powers. Uh, the uh, Telecommunications Act allows for the placement of cell towers in locations with very little control by municipalities. So I suppose there are exceptions to my no answer. It's rare for the federal government to step in and allow development of a property in a Massachusetts municipality without the municipality having any say whatsoever. I can't say it's impossible. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. Anyone else? Uh, I, who had their hand up? Uh, Mr. Suk Mr. Sukolowski. Good evening. Um, I just want to make sure that <clears throat> we kind of rein this back in a little bit, but uh, I want to thank the public for all their uh, letters and uh, correspondence. There's been pages of them and, and I have reviewed them all and they're, and they're very thoughtful. And as well as the applicant for um, doing a professional job um, and, and to, to speak to your point, Bernie, you know, there's a little bit that we have to agree on to get, get forward with. And even the uh, well-spoken lawyer from Amherst that represents the uh, condo association during our September meeting agreed that the property is in fact developable. And then we talk about the special permit process. So we think to ourselves, why is an applicant here for a special permit? And there's a lot of permitted uses, I get that. And the special permit process from town meeting a long time ago is in order to put some control into the things that we identified. We want to make sure that there's adequate planning for traffic. We want to make sure that the building meets the character of the community. And by having the applicant or any applicant decide to build something not by right or of this size, that allows us this control. And it allowed us already to uh, work with the applicant or maybe even push them towards a better building design than we see in other communities, like the ugly one, ugly retail location um, that are out there, or the pre-existing buildings that don't look as good as the proposed building here. So, you know, I'm just want to keep that in mind that they're here for a special permit, so we have some control. Where, in the event that this uh, applicant or another applicant either 
super uh, goes to the court and has them make a decision, we have less control. Or if they build something by right, then we have less control. So those are all things that that I think we need to remember as a board to keep in mind that we're in a position of control working with the applicant and um, they've made some changes that have made things better. So um, I don't know uh, how you, how you want to continue, but I, I just think that that's important and we can continue down that, that line um, of applying this application um, to our bylaw. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? I was going to, uh, close with something that you said, but you kind of beat me to it. You eloquently said it better than I could about uh, the process we've had. Anyone else for comments, questions? Do you think we've covered the uh, 5324, 5325, and 5326 correctly? Any more questions? Any questions on those specifics? Yeah, I, 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 I don't think we've really started to go through that analysis. Okay. Uh, All right. But, yeah. but, I, but I'd like to kind of revisit 5322 traffic flow uh, because since the, our last hearing, there's been kind of a change in Deerfield uh, or at least a proposed change and a proposed use of Route 5 and 10, which uh, I think affects the traffic study. If uh, Treehouse Brewing does go into the Channing Beat uh, facility, um, as someone who's been to the, their brewery in, uh, in Charlton, they had, to, they had to expand their version of 5 and 10, which is Route 20, because of the tra traffic. Um, I don't think we have much control over Treehouse Brewing, but uh, that, I think, changes the traffic count, and it changes what is going to be going on at that intersection in the future. So... I don't know how we deal with that, but I think that's a significant, uh, significant change in how we looked at that before. Uh, I don't know whether the board wants to discuss that or if it's worthy of discussion, but it's something I took note of when I went, when I saw the developments in the newspapers. Okay, thank you. Well, I think Mr. Sokolowski has a comment. Well, uh, <clears throat> yes, Adam Sokolowski again. I think it would be unfair to ask any applicant to determine what may or may not happen in the future on any said road. Um, I, I just, you know, when you think about this, you think about this as if you're sitting here as a judge trying to treat people fairly. And I, how should we, if, if you were a property owner, or if I was a property owner and I wanted to sell my property to anybody, how could we say, well, something might happen down the road. We want you to try to do a study and plan for that. What's clear here is that they're making improvements to the existing road that aren't there. They're going to make improvements. They're going to pay for it, not the taxpayers. And it's going to make five and 10 safer at that intersection than it currently is. So to me, their traffic study that's been peer reviewed by the town's peer reviewer meets the litmus test from, from my perspective that they're improving safety on a, on a roadway already. And, and I think it would be completely outside of the realm of this board to try to make any applicant speculate about the future. And I think if any type of business moves in and they come to us or not, if they have to, they have to work with MassDOT, then that's, that's on them. I, I can't imagine, you know, what if it was just someone building a house and they wanted a driveway permit? Would you say to them, well, something might happen down the road where we might need you to reconsider your driveway permit? I just, I don't think that, and I don't think legally any judge would say that we could have the ability to make an applicant speculate. Well, uh, I don't think it's speculation. I think the property has been bought. I don't think that the, the, the our board, it'll come before our board or any board with respect to traffic and our town is gonna have to uh, kind of deal with that traffic that that facility is going to generate. And if we're going to be doing planning on an intersection, we ought to uh, do that well and know that it is taking into consideration what the future traffic flows are going to be. It's not speculation. This is going to happen. They've already bought it. If they said they're going to open in the winter um, and they draw tremendous crowds. So uh, I think the traffic numbers are, you know, kind of dated now. Um, and not and and I think based upon 
the activity that goes on in Charlton, I think you can make a reasonable estima estimation. I think a, a traffic study could probably figure out how much traffic they're going to have in and out of there, how much is going to go north on 5 and 10 as opposed to south, which I think the majority is going to go to the exits uh, on uh, of Route 91, but some are going to go to Greenfield. How many? I don't know. Mr. Uh, Chairman, the building commissioner is trying to get your attention. I, I, I'm waiting for, I know Mr. Decker. I okay. see Bob's hand up, okay? So please wait to be acknowledged so we don't get into confusion here. Mr. Are you finished, John? I am. Thank you, John. Uh, Bob, you're next, please. Uh, well, Building Commissioner, I don't really want to get in the middle of the discussion with the applicant, but um, Treehouse Brewery will be going through site plan review, and they will be going to the zoning board for a special permit, if that makes any difference in the future. They will come before this board? Yes, it will. Okay. Okay, uh, other comments, questions? Okay, um, are we gonna go back over the uh, specifics of each of the areas or do we, did we cover those? I thought he covered them pretty well, but I'm just one of the members. Well, I think when we broke, we only had gone through three of them. Am I right? Uh, and I thought we were doing some discussion on each one of those. And I thought uh, you, as Mr. Mr. Chairman, you invited us to comment on each right. one of the uh, characteristics. Correct. Right. Right. I thought he covered them pretty well, but, but that's, that's why I'm asking you. Um, so we want to go to 5324, neighborhood, neighborhood characteristics and social structures. Comments or questions to uh, Mr. Donahue or his other a contingency that he has here. Mr. Sokolowski. Mr. Sokolowski, um, my question on the neighborhood character, we were shown a couple different, I want the applicant to clarify the signage. Um, some of your retail locations or this retail location um, was shown uh, in the latest form to us with um, black writing and white backgrounds on the signs not specific to any trade uh, or any specific retailer. Um, and I understand that we have to treat you as such, but I, I would think that there's not a lot of bright colored signs in the neighborhood. Uh, most of the signs are monotone. Most of them are on the building um, or subdued, uh, not close to the roadway, but um, maybe the applicant wants to clarify their request for signage um, before we move forward on this. Um, I, I, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue, I, I don't know whether we can answer that, and it's not because I'm trying to avoid it, but I don't know if we really had enough discussion with uh, an end user as to specifically what they want, nor have we got a whole lot of guidance as to what, for lack of a better term, the board or the, or the town wants beyond the bylaw. Uh, we're, we're open to understanding what the parameters are that you are trying to apply to everybody. Um, even though they're not in the bylaw, with, and we haven't done that kind of forensic research on other special permits. And we're glad, of, you know, as a condition of approval to work with Attorney Costa on drafting something that means that we would bring it back to you for some level of reasonable approval. Um, but I, I, I hate to say right now, you know, it's going to be black on white when, you know, it, it may be it may be wood engraved with exterior lighting for all I know. We just haven't had that discussion at this point with the, with the, any potential user. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Uh, just to respond to that, I think that uh, if we were to move forward with allowing the special permit, then we would have a condition for a return for, sti for signage um, if the members so wished. But um, the bright colored signage, I think it's outside of the neighborhood character, but other retail locations similar to the corporation that you're representing does have some better looking, uh, less bright uh, signage on some of their locations. So I think uh, that direction also looks better with the uh, barn style design. Yeah, that's, I, that's where I am on that. I, through you, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. I, I don't disagree with any of that. I, you know, I, I, and I said, I, I think if the board was so inclined to turn in cost and I could get a condition that would let, let us come back before we came back, I think we'd need some idea of what, you know, what we were trying to aim at in some fashion, but I think we can achieve that through dialogue. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Johnson. Yes, Mr. Stabersky. Uh, 
if I could address this question to Mr. Donahue, and I'm focusing on uh, uh, 5324, the neighborhood character and social structure. Other than the comparison between what could go there and what you're proposing, um, are there any benefits to the neighborhood or so character or social structure from uh, this proposal? And if so, what are they? And I really don't want to hear the comparison. I just want to have a standalone uh, review of your proposal with respect to that criteria. Certainly, through you, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue, uh, there certainly are. And I think it goes to the design of the site and the design of the building. Because what's important when you're dealing with a property that is in, for lack of a better term, inconsistent zoning, commercial zoning, abutting a residential use, particularly where there's no um, vegetated buffer that can be preserved you know, or, or reserved in some fashion, which if this was a wooded lot, we'd be talking about no cut zones or something of that nature. I think the benefit is that it has been designed to create visual buffers from the commercial use that benefit the residential mm -hmm. neighborhood. Those visual buffers are, as I said, the landscape buffer, which we talked about the maturity of the plantings uh, at the time of planting, the stockade, the fact that it, the property or the building is set back a significant distance from the property line. Uh, and then finally, it's also the nature of the architecture, which has developed over a period of time and evolved so that, for example, roof elements uh, are well screened, as you saw during the course of the visuals, uh, so that those can't be seen even over the top of all of those, depending on the angle. I think the best thing you can do to try to minimize the detrimental impact uh, for a use that remembers doesn't create um, very much, if any, noise and doesn't create any um, glare into the neighborhood because of the lighting that we've reviewed in more detail. The best thing you can do is try to create that screening, which other properties in the commercial zone have done through natural uh, areas, uh, either uh, by direction or by uh, design. Um, here we don't have that benefit, so I think it is a benefit. We created that uh, buffer between the two zones that are always going to be inconsistent. You're on mute. You're on I'm mute. not on mute. I said thank you. No, I, I was the yeah. chairman was speaking, but I, I muted because I'm in an office where the phone was ringing. I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, have we covered? 5324 sufficiently. Any more questions? Oh, Mr. Potter. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring us back to um, the applicant's written statement about um, the neighborhood character. Um, and um, I want to remind the board that we're looking for benefits. And for them to describe a benefit as um, a screen, a visual screen, a double visual screen is not a benefit to the town. It's a benefit against what could be worse, where there's no screen to prevent the unsightliness of this building. But it is not a benefit to the town. It's really strategically worded and it's um it's deceptive it's not a benefit to the town and i don't think anybody here could tell me but could really argue that a building with two screens brings benefit so the neighborhood character that they're saying um they're saying that the proposed use is consistent with the neighborhood character um, but we've discussed this many times that the neighborhood is what what you can feel and see as you pass by the building uh, in either direction and there's nothing like it in either direction visually uh, I know that the Yankee candle in the uh, uh, warehouse is there it is very well screened and it is not uh, nearly as high as what has been uh, uh, shown to us for this building um, the um, the, the fact that the property far exceeds any of the applicable dimensional setbacks under the bylaw is not a benefit. The, so for him to say that they're complying with 
you know, uh, uh, con uh, existing laws and bylaws does not create a benefit. Um, the proposal would be one of the smaller commercial developments in the immediate area. That is not true. You can't see any of the much larger or equally as large buildings that are well down uh, five and 10 from that corner. Uh, they're not part of the immediate area. Um, and, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, so, so I, I just don't see where there is a benefit to the neighborhood character. I see where there's mitigating factors. I can appreciate the design. I can appreciate their sensitivity to signage um, preferences, um, but those don't create benefit. Those only um, mitigate what's, um, what is to many people. And I will refer finally to the neighborhood being the people who came out to speak to this board and overwhelmingly representing that neighborhood and its character telling us it does not. So I think that we have a fairly subjective term here, a very subjective parameter to weigh against, but, um, but uh, you know, I think when you take into consideration the fact of how the neighborhood has spoken to this project and proposal, um, it clearly is not benefiting the, um, the neighborhood character and social structures. And Mr. Donahue, your response? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue. Um, with all due respect to the member, I, I, I think the point has been missed. Um, and, and just to let me echo it, you're, you're dealing with properties that are in a, some, some form of a general neighborhood that are going to be used inherently for mutually inconsistent purposes. That's simply a reality that has to exist. The best thing the benefits here are, are to add to the way that those two neighbors, the commercial use and the residential use, can be and remain separated from one another. It, by way of examples, one of the reasons why we agreed to add the pedestrian and bike connection to Mill Village Road, but not a road connection because that would have had additional impacts upon the residential neighborhood. Um, we, it, this is different than adding something to a neighborhood and saying it adds to it. Once you look to the rear of the property, by definition, it's going to be inconsistent with a residential use. The best you can do, and I do see it as a benefit quite strongly, is try to keep them away from each other, for lack of a better term, through the visual buffers, through the lack of traffic going through the neighborhood, through the lighting not having any impact, through the noise being mitigated in every possible fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downing. Anyone else for comments? Uh, yeah. If I may. Yes, Alex. Um, so I sort of did some thinking about, um, and I don't know if this is the right, uh, time to be to maybe discuss them but I think Adam brought up um, maybe a possible um, discussion about the sign um, that was one of the uh, conditions if you will um, maybe asks I guess that I would maybe have um, and if you guys want to talk about it that would be cool um, so the sign was one of them um, and again like uh, attorney Donahue said it's it's challenging because you have two opposites fighting each other, um, the residential and the commercial. Um, and I drove by a few times today or in the last week and stopped and looked at the property line. I don't know how the other board members feel, but I don't, maybe it would help if there was more vegetation between the two to separate the um, property line so that there's even more screening. I don't know if that would, um, add to the character to sort of bring back the um, original uh, property where it was uh, quite developed uh, in terms of um, foliage. Uh, that was just something I was thinking about. Um, I did see the bike path at the uh, planning board meeting that I like that. Um, I think that could tie into um, developments on five and 10 for uh, the complete street or bikes, et cetera. Uh, let's see. Um, 
this may create more issues, but um, I don't know if the applicant has considered um, solar on the building. Um, I know it would probably be another permitting process, but um, I think that might be something to explore. Um, and let's see, the screening, the solar, and the sign. Um, yeah, those are just some thoughts that I had. Where's Mr. Costa? Mr. Costa. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, well, you and I had discussed these um, special conditions and where we're gonna address those after we had finished these um, six items. Oh, oh we're gonna draw it up. I, I'm sorry, I should have, that's my fault. I should have expressed it, that we were gonna discuss uh, conditions before we went to an approval of this program and this permit. Okay, I'm sorry, that's my fault. But we're gonna we're gonna address those. Am I correct, Mr. Costa? So, so Mr. Chairman, you're you're correct, except that you know that that presumes you, you just used the word approval. It presumes a certain. I'm outcome. sorry. Right. Right. So so I mean the way this process would typically go is you would continue to work through the various criteria contained in the law, and then once you've done that and you feel that you have all the information you need, you would close the public hearing and then you would begin to deliberate. And if you're deliberating and the sense of the board is that you'll be approving the project, you'll then need to discuss what conditions you'll impose as part of that approval. If the sense is that you'll deny it, then there's no need for a discussion of conditions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Well, I think we should uh, you know, consider moving towards deliberations. Okay, we got 52.25 and 52.26. I think we have to go quickly over those. Now, the other thing is I want to bring up that we have to be out of here at 930. Am I correct, Jen? We have to be finished by state law. Am I correct? Well, by the governor's orders, they're saying that right. they want to, you know, to be. Okay. So we, you, I agree with you, Mrs. Sokolowski. I agree, but I just wanted, I should have said that to begin the meeting. We need to get through at 930. Okay. Um, well, 50, it's 730. So if we want to adjourn when we're at 830, let's at least go for another hour here and try to Okay. Make okay. Some progress. Well, the problem I have is you didn't turn your clocks back. Yeah, it's your office and it's nine. Th it's eight thirty by me. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, fifty-three twenty-five. Comments, questions by any board members. Uh, I have. Yes, a, John uh, Staberski. I'd ask. Uh, I'd ask Attorney Donahue. Is there any benefits? in your mind to the natural environment that this project is bringing to the town of Deerfield? Um, candidly, I, I don't know if there's any, you know, great uh, benefit uh, from the natural environment. Um, we don't see as any detriment. Um, we've, we've discussed before and it's beyond the purview of this board, but the applicant doesn't believe that it's impacting any wetland area. Um, it's a relatively developed and cleared site already. Um, so it would be hard to point that somehow the, the world is better with a building on that site than it is in, in its natural state. Thank you. Any other questions on, oh boy, I'm sorry, on 5220, uh, 5325, anyone else question, with questions? On to 5326, potential impact, financial impact, including impact in town services, tax base, and employment. Questions or questions for Mr. Donahue? No hands up? I can't believe it. Oh, uh, yes, I, Jennifer. <laughs> sorry. Um, I just wanted to clarify if, because I keep getting questions from the public, if you could just address whether or not that's something you're going to open or has that ended um, just because there's certain in certain of the criteria I have questions that are popping up. So. Okay. Mr. Costa, you and I are going to have a little discussion here. Mr. Costa? Yes. Okay. My understanding is if there was no new information that we can keep the uh, public discussion ended. Is that correct? So it, it's always left to the discretion of the board and specifically the chair, whether and when to allow public participation. So a, a point that I've made, um, I know I've made it to you before, Mr. Chairman, and maybe yes. I 
maybe I haven't made it in one of these meetings, is that the statute doesn't contemplate uh, hearings that are continued from time to time. The statute speaks very generally of the public hearing. And so whether it's one session or five sessions or 10 sessions, collectively those sessions comprise the public hearing. And certainly because it is a public hearing, there is a requirement that at some point during that process, the public be permitted to participate. How they participate, with what frequency they participate, for how long they're permitted to participate, how many times they participate, that's all left to the discretion of the board. So um, it, it's up to your board, it's up to you, the extent to which you think that public participation at tonight's meeting is warranted or not. Okay, let's get a consensus of the board. I don't wanna be the only person up here that expresses my opinion. I think it's, uh, we've been pretty consistent when we did this that I've asked the board for their decision. Um, some people don't like the fact that I'm not running those with the iron fist, but I think it's a democracy. And um, these people have, a, the board members have a right to uh, their own opinions and, and I'm gonna ask them for their own opinions without prejudice. Okay, so let's take a quick, what we're asked, what I'm gonna ask you is, should we open up to public comments and discussion in this meeting? Um, Everyone understand what we're asking about? Yes, a I yes do, means, I hear you. A yes means we're gonna to vote to open it up and a no vote means we're going to keep it closed with no con no addition. Okay. For new information. For new inf for new information, correct. Mr. Chair, can I could I uh, just maybe broaden the discussion a little bit? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I was reviewing the questions that were being received, and I saw that the lawyer for um, the butter had raised some questions, um, and. You know, I'm not, I think we've given people a lot of time for, for, for input, but I think if he would like to address the board, uh, Mr. Attorney Leo, I think that would be a, a, an appropriate opening up of, uh, of, the, of the public uh, hearing to let him speak to the, to, to the board. Uh, I don't know if we want to take, you know, start the whole public comment period over again, but I think at least he should be able to address the board. Okay, Mr. Decker, comment. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> we've had hearings going for several months. We've had input, input, and input. And I think it's time that we close the hearing and render a decision. The time has come. Otherwise, if you let one more person talk, and it gets continued again, somebody else is going to want to come in. You know, some of us are getting old. We could die on this job. You know, it's, it's time consuming and it's challenging, but I think we need, and we owe it to the townspeople to make a decision and not kick the can any further down the road. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? I would tend to agree that we, we made a vote to close public comment. We've been kind enough. I've read all my email and taken everything else that's been emailed into heart. So I don't think that we need to go open that Pandora's box again. Um, that's, that's my opinion on it. And uh, I think it's time to move forward. Okay. I'd like to make a comment. Um, I've looked at the paperwork I've had and luckily I've got a wife that's willing to do this stuff. I have over a thousand pages that I have read over. And I mean, I've read them all over, and I think everyone else has. That's a lot, a lot of information. And I think they've had ample time. However, I am not gonna make a judgment by myself. And we'll take a vote on it, but you all have gone through the same thing. We have read this and read this and read this, and it's like I'm going through my, I'm doing, I'm doing more paperwork than I, did than I was a teacher. I'm thinking, what did I get myself into? So let's take a straw vote and go with this. Uh, Alex. Uh, we're voting. Uh, okay. okay. We're, let me clear it. Clarify. Pontificated, but we're we're voting to keep it closed. No more public input. Are, you, are we making a motion, or are we just taking a? No, we're taking a straw vote because I don't think uh, okay. we need a vote on this. Well, we okay. already voted on it once, Mr. Chair. I know, but no, I... we're just giving it, Alex. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. Uh, no, I think we should keep it closed. Okay, Mr. Staberski. 
I think we should allow Mr. Leo to, to uh, make a uh, closing remark uh, uh, on behalf of, uh, of the neighborhood group. Okay, Mr. Decker. I think we should close it. Mr. Potter. Close Mr. it. Potter. Is Mr. Potter voting tonight? Because he's I'm still officer. part of the discussion. He's part of the Mr. discussion. Costa said. The only time that I make it, I believe, Mr. Costa, am I correct? That when we go to vote, I have to declare the voting people, but we've allowed all members to speak throughout this hearing, correct? Um, that's correct, Mr. Chair. If this is nothing more than a straw poll, then certainly. Right. right. So uh, I'm trying to be consistent here. Thank you. But thank you for c your concern, Mr. Decker and Mr. Sokolowski. We need to continue with the hearing. Well, public comment was already voted closed. Okay. In September. So it doesn't make any difference how I vote. I'm, I was going to vote to not continue public hearing. So it's been denied. So we're going to stop public comments. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I just want to bring to attention, I'm, I'm monitoring, as maybe some of you are too, the, the comments, the question and answer that come in during the course of the meeting. And so I see that Attorney Leo did comment on the fact that if you are not going to allow public comment, further public comment, uh, that uh, he nonetheless had submitted correspondence. So I just want to remind the board that although you did take a vote to uh, discontinue further public comment, at the last session of the public hearing, you did not close the hearing. So that letter that was submitted, and maybe some of you have it in front of you, some of you don't, but that letter should be considered by the board. It should become part of the record. It was rightfully submitted to the board and accepted by the board because it was submitted during the public hearing process. Just a clarification. Okay, I think I read it over. I don't know about anybody else, but I've read all this stuff over. Like I said, thousand some pages. Um, and I had a chance to read it over. I've read over everything including the handwritten letters that we got. So if you've looked, you've seen we've got handwritten letters, which I think we'd never see again, written in script. So we've read these over. I see Mr. Potter laughing because he's a school teacher. He knows what I'm talking about. Okay, <laughs> but I think we've all got them. We've all read them over. And I think we've all used that information. <laughs> um, this has not been easy. All of us have really put a lot of time in here. Um, and we've got a lot of public comments, and I'm, I'm thankful we got that because that's important to the process. We've looked at everyone's information, and I agree with Mr. Decker. It's time for us to move on if we have no more questions and go from here. Any more questions about anything? Because if, I'm sta if I stand correct, Mr. Costa, once we close this discussion, we're not allowed to ask any questions of anybody except you. Am I correct? Mr. Chairman, once you close the public hearing, you can deliberate. Deliberate can mean that you can discuss amongst yourselves, ask questions of one another. You can certainly ask questions of me and questions of um, uh, staff. Um, to the extent that you have clarifying questions of the applicant that is not new information, I generally tell my boards that I think that they can be on somewhat of a longer leash in terms of asking clarifying questions if it's necessary to crafting the decision or condition, but certainly there can be no new information, there can be no new public participation, no new public comment, That's, that portion of the meeting would be, would be closed. Okay, <clears throat> so I take it we have to decide here now if we're gonna close the meeting. Am I correct in my terminology? My old Mr. Sokolowski has a comment. Well, I was gonna make a motion, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay, thank oh. you, Mr. And, and it's, it's hearing, not meeting. Yes, it's hearing. We're not going to close the meeting, although it is getting close to crib time. I get that, but uh, I'm going to make a motion that we close the public hearing on move towards deliberation for this applicant. Second. Okay, we have to go to vote. Am I correct? We have to go to vote on this. Okay, vote to, I keep getting this terminology wrong. Close public discussion. Is that one? Is that right? Close the, right the public term? hearing was my Close motion. Close the public hearing. Okay, Mr. Decker. Yes. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. Alex. Yes. Mr. Stabersky. Yes. 
And I believe Mr. Potter is not going to be a voting member, so he, his vote will not be taken. Am I correct in that, Mr. Okay. And I vote yes. So as of this, it's been taken, and we have now moved into the deliberation phase. Is that correct? Am I right in my terminology? Yes. Yes. Okay. Why don't we take a quick, quick bathroom break, because this is going to take some time, I'm sure. Anybody object? Nope. Five-minute cool. five minute break. Uh, so at um, about 10 of 9, we're back on again. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. We've got... We got, uh, we, we, got, got our five. we got our five. We got our folks back. We got Austin and uh, Jen. Okay, Jen's back. Mr. Co Mr. Costa, you there? Him. Okay. Um, this is where I'm kind of, and I need your help on this terminology, so because I, I, I know I'm get, not getting it right. Um, are we going to um, go into this discussion? Do you want to go over what we have to, uh, the terminology we have to use, or am I going to say this? Um, what we have to look at, well, we're going to wait. You want to wait till we get done with this? Um, what we have to look at to approve it or deny it before we go into this discussion, or you want to wait till we all have a chance to discuss it and go from there? Are you speaking to me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I am. Sorry, Mr. Costa. That's okay. So if, if all the members are ready, I can sort of give a little bit of an introduction as to what you ought to be doing in deliberations and then quickly hand it over to you. I'd you appreciate ready? that. Are you ready for me to do that now? Yes. Would you do it now, please? Okay. So um, all of you have seen, and, and if you haven't, I, I, can, I can share my screen or, 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 or Jen can. Um, but we've had discussions from the very opening of the public hearing about Section 5320 of the Zoning Bylaw. That's really what these deliberations are all about. And really, it's what the better part of the last two, two meetings, two sessions of the public hearing have been all about. And that is the standard, that a special permit may be granted, a written determination by your board, that the benefits of the proposed use outweigh its detrimental impacts on the town and on the neighborhood in view of site characteristics and of the proposal in relation to that site. And then you've got the six criteria that we've talked about at length. Number one, social, economic, or community needs, which are served by the proposal. Number two, traffic flow and safety, which includes parking and loading. Number three, adequacy of utilities and other public services. Number four, neighborhood character and social structures. Number five, impacts on the natural environment. And then number six, potential fiscal impact. And that includes impacts on town services, on the tax base, on employment, things of that sort. So again, the overarching standard is that, that balancing, that weighing of benefits against detrimental impacts. And in performing that task, you look to consideration of those six criteria that I just referenced. So your deliberation should be structured according to what I just described. There's no, there doesn't have to be absolute rhyme or reason. There's no one right way to do it. You can bounce around, you can take them up one at a time, much like you did with the applicant over the past couple of meetings. Uh, you can discuss the general standard and in doing that, make a, your best efforts to work in the six criteria. All I can tell you is that when you're done with the deliberation process, the going back and forth, the having a discussion, um, referencing potential justifications for the satisfaction of these standards or potential justification for uh, the failure to satisfy these standards, when you're done with that process, we'll need to have a, a more um, uh, uh, direct discussion, a more confined discussion about one, two, three, four, five, six, are each of these standards met? And what are we going to say in a decision? Is that going to be an approval decision or a denial decision? 
one thing that I want to remind the board of, and this is where I'll wrap it up, is that if you're going to grant a special permit, you have to find that every standard has been satisfied. If you wish to deny the special permit, it can be denied for failure to satisfy any one of the standards. So that's sort of where I'll leave it to the board. Again, reflecting back on section 5320, that defines the, the, the beginning and the end of your, your purview as a board. Okay, so what we're going to, we're not, we're gonna go into just a kind of a discussion and approval, approval of finding will be the last step, is that correct? Or so what I typically what I typically recommend of boards, especially with a project that um, is as maybe complex as the wrong word, but um, that that has taken as much time and effort um, as as this particular application has, you, you don't want to. Once you vote, you're on a clock. So right now you're on a 90 day clock from the close of the public hearing. So you have 90 days to meet as frequently or infrequently as you want, and to render a decision. Once you take a vote you have 14 days to file that decision with the town clerk's office. And so I don't recommend, I wouldn't recommend even if we talked tonight and you came to a definitive decision that you were going to approve it or deny it, I wouldn't recommend that you take that vote because then we're all in a big hurry to put together a written decision. So typically when deliberations come to a close and you have a sense as to what you're going to do, I recommend that you, rather than vote yay or nay on the project, you vote to instruct the chair or town council or staff to draft either an approval with conditions or a denial. And then you just simply adjourn the meeting and reconvene again in some future date within 90 days to review that written approval or denial so that by the time you're ready to vote, you've actually got a written document in front of you that you're voting on. I think that's important for this, this comprehensive of a project. Okay, this was this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to go through each one of our. You're muted. You're muted. Bernie. Sometimes I'm better off if I am muted. Uh, to go through all, all of the six topics, and everyone gets a chance to speak on these topics or not speak, and we move on. That's how I want to approach it. So that way we can kind of follow along. I mean, it's probably for my benefit as much as anyone's is trying to follow this process. So we're going to start with 5321, social economic community needs served by this proposal. I open that to discussion. Mr. Chair, John yes. Uh I have a, more of a point of order or information. Yep. Um, and it deals with uh, a misimpression I may have had, and I don't know whether what, if other people have this or not, but there was a reference to a letter of attorney Aleo, and, um, and uh, you know, over the break, I had thought that that was the letter that he had written months and months ago uh, on this, uh, very early in the process, and it was brought to my attention that he had authored a recent letter that was supposed to be in the packet of comments. I actually picked it up today from the town hall. I didn't ever receive that letter nor see it. And from some of the comments that I read here is that we're that was supposed to be taken, you know, in lieu of kind of a closing argument of his. Did anybody else get a recent letter? Am I am I missing the ball here? because it wasn't anything that I ever received from, uh, from anybody at the town hall. Um, okay, response, Jennifer Garnett. Janet. Um, oh, Gan I'm sorry, <laughs> Jennifer okay. from now on. <laughs> Poor Janet. Um, so the packet was letters that were dropped off by the public. And so we put those out because they dropped off actual paper copies. And we said, you know, and we also scan them. We also put them on our website. We also put um, so then the, the uh, uh, email that came in from attorney Leo was, I have to confirm because Sue was supposed to have sent it to all the board members. It's also put up on our website. I did notice that it was labeled incorrect correctly. It said attorney from attorney Donahue, but it was from attorney Leo, but it is there on the calendar because I did check that. Um, I changed that as well. Um, did other 
board members received that letter from Sue. There was a lot of emails today, like a ton so of it, emails from. So it's from, from Sue specifically. It should have been, yeah. Okay, one sec. It, when did it get sent out? Because I, I don't. Again, I got a separate email from from Michael. Um, that wasn't the one that because he sent it to that office. So I'd have to I'd have to go back and look. I have like over a hundred emails from today. So mm -hmm. it's the one that's dated October fifteenth. No, it's today. It's 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 dated November. 11th, I believe. All right. The 15th one came out today. That was authored um, as from the abutters, and it looked like it was well written, so I could have thought that was written by a lawyer. No, it's here. I can share my screen. And do you know when it went up on the website on, uh, on the town? Yeah, it went up today. And I mean, I'm not checking it all the time, so I, I didn't see it when I looked at it earlier. Um, well, but I wasn't looking. Maybe it was from you know. Can you see it, or no? Here. Yeah, it's coming up now. Butcher Tilton, November 11th. Yes, that I read that. Yeah, that's that that that's from Attorney Donahue. There was, uh, I understand, there was a letter from Attorney a Leo though. Oh, right. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um. You are correct. I'm sorry. Uh, Well, you want to continue while I look for it. Okay. All right. Discussion on um, 5321. Comments or questions referring to social, economic, and com community needs as served by this proposal. Okay. This is the one now. I've shared my screen, Jennifer, because I had easy access to it. It came through today. So is, I think this is the document that you're referencing, Mr. Staversky. Yeah, I've never seen it before, so I don't know what it says um, and whether it raised any. I mean, there were some comments that were made on uh, at the meeting by some of the public that it raised new issues, and we had stated that we were going to let the public comment on new issues, and I haven't read it, so I don't know if it did or not, but I saw that on the, on the screen. I said, oh, then there's, there's must be another letter out there. Um, so I don't, you know, no, it's just, it's unfortunate. Well, I think it's still part of the record. I'm sorry, Adam Sikolowski again. And, uh, cause it was received before, just like Mr. Costa said, all, all the stuff that we received prior to the, um, closing and going to this, this, uh, stage is all part of the record. So as long as it's received, we can still view it. And if you wish to use it. Yes. Right Mr. Um, right, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yep. So this email came in at three this afternoon, it looks like, and it was sent to the building department. I think I forwarded it to you, right, Adam Costa? Um, so I asked her to send it to everybody. And did anybody else see this letter before? I did not get this letter. Nope. I was here in town office, so I didn't see it. Well, I mean, we closed the public hearing, but this wasn't submitted to us. Interesting. Well, it was submitted. Well, so, so, well can well, we see it? So to just, just as a point of clarity, because I want to be sure that the record does reflect what has and hasn't been received and what can and can't be discussed and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this document was received by staff and was as I understand it, submitted to the board, made a part of the board proceeding earlier today. It came in late in the day. I got it shortly after Jen got it, I guess, uh, mid-afternoon today. 
So my understanding based upon that is that it is part of the board's record and can be considered by the board. Um, I, I will confirm or, or, or echo what Mr. Staberski said that I'm not gonna comment on the substance of the letter, but to the extent that the letter raises issues, you have closed the public hearing. So you, know, you, you can consider what the letter says, but you can't, you know, Attorney Alio and, and others haven't, you know, haven't spoken to the substance of it beyond what the letter says for itself. Um, so. so, so Attorney Costa, even though this was not submitted to any member of the board, uh, that it can be part of the public record just because it got to town hall before we close public hearing. Well, I mean, therein uh, lies lies the the ambiguity. So. I, no, I would not say that just because it arrived at town hall means it's part of the record, but a, a letter from attorney Leo is, I mean, I, I specifically made mention of this before the public hearing was closed and board members indicated that this was something that um, they were aware of. And then the public hearing closed. If it was accepted on behalf of the board and it's in your record and it was in your record before you closed the hearing. And I understand that it's all a little wishy-washy these days with um, with, with these Zoom meetings, we're not in person, so we don't have a paper file in front of us. But if it was part of the record before the hearing closed and it's appropriately uh, un under consideration by the board during the deliberation stage, if you were to tell me that no member of the board received it, the only person that had received it was, you know, some unknown person in town hall, and that might be a different story. Oh, uh, I mean, I... I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think anybody from the board received it. Some uh, personnel at town hall received it and didn't forward it to the board. Uh, you know, and I don't think it's really appropriate to go through the, the criteria without even being able to read it and look at it. I mean, when you mentioned a letter, I thought you were referring to a letter from months ago because there was one other letter that we received from, from attorney Alio and it wasn't this one, obviously. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, Mr. Potter, um, of the board, for um, uh, Mr. Costa, um, didn't you say we could ask clarifying questions of no, a number of people? No, you cannot ask questions. We're not. No, asking. no, 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 Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I'm no, directing we're not my go, question no, to Mr. Costa. No, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go Excuse open me. that door up. He said, I'm sorry. He said that we. I'm had... not entertaining this. I'm not entertaining it. You're, End of you're discussion. Not even, you're not even hearing my question. I'm not entertaining the question. As chairman, I'm saying, I'm not entertaining it. Discussion has ended. Am I correct, Mr. Costa? Deliberation has ended? Your, your comment has ended. Thank you. Okay, let's get back, Mr. Pot, uh, Mr. Uh, Costa. I had a chance to read that. Did everyone else have a chance to read that over? No. Okay. No, it's not well, been shown to us. Hasn't been Mr. shown to us. Potter, Mr. Potter, any more comments and I'm going to shut you off. I was answering your question. You're going to get shut off. No more comments. Thank you. Mr. Decker, did you have a chance to read it? Mr. Decker, did you have a chance to read it? He's not speaking. Uh, Mr. Alex, did you hear? Did you have a chance to read it? Now, I meant right now. I didn't realize I was muted. Okay. He, Mr. I, Decker, did you have a chance to read it? Yeah, I just skimmed it. I haven't read it for detail. Okay. Alex? Uh, no, I, ha I haven't. Okay. I, I, would, I would need time to look at it. Okay, Mr. Staberski, you haven't read it. I, all I saw was a couple little paragraphs that were posted by Attorney Costa, so I haven't seen the whole letter. I, okay. I don't know, even know how many pages it is. Okay, Mr. Costa, is that the whole letter or is that part of it? 20, 25, or 30 pages. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the entire letter, I mean, the, the text of the letter itself is just shy of three pages. There are then a series of attachments. The entire file is 18 pages long. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would say that I think it's appropriate if you were shown it in town hall and the lawyer agrees that it's part of the record, and if we get it emailed out to us tomorrow, we're not going to end deliberation or make a right. final vote tonight. Right. I don't ha see there's any harm or foul in doing it. The other thing to remember is everybody knew we closed public comment in September. You know, to expect us to get a 
email at town hall at three o'clock on the day of the meeting, two months after public comments closed, and then why want to fly that flag tonight. This has been going on for years and it doesn't make a difference what side of the fence you're on. Everybody knew that public comment was closed in September. Now the hearing is closed. So um, I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. And we should move forward with deliberation, starting with the first, uh, first uh, one on, on of, our, of our six. And, and that's, that's my point on it. Okay, I, I am in agreement. We, we, we don't have it, but let's not get tied up till we don't, we can, do we have a chance to read it over? Like I, I agree with you, Mr. Sokolowski, last minute things dump on us and then, oh, you didn't have a chance to read it. Well, they've had plenty of time to give us information, plenty of time. And the, and the thing is, the people in that office have been inundated, inundated with information. And you can't blame them for not being able to do this. This, this is not the only thing that they're doing in that office but they have been inundated with information and, and paperwork. They're doing the best that they can. And we're doing the best that we can and people need to understand that. Mr. Oh. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> might I say, ask a question? Has attorney Donahue been furnished a copy of this letter? Uh, because they certainly should have sent it to opposing counsel also, okay? So I just, as a courtesy, they should have sent it to him. I don't know if it's been to him or not. My other suggestion is it's roughly 8.15 or so, and we've been here since five o'clock. Are we gonna accomplish anything more tonight? Otherwise we should come back in December with the idea of, of coming to a conclusion and drawing up a, a draft decision one way or the other. Okay, I think we can continue. Don't you agree? Uh, I don't, I, I do not agree. Okay, Alex. Now, let, me, let me tell you why. Because Mr. Leo was denied uh, making a closing statement based upon this letter. If he had something to bear on any of these criteria that we were going to discuss now, and we don't have the benefit of all the information, if there was new information out there, we're kind of discussing it, you know, not with having everything at our disposal and deliberating with not the full evidence uh, in front of us. So I think, I think, uh, Mr. Decker is right that we should have a, a time to review that, consider it. And when we finally sit down and deliberate, we have all the facts in front of us rather than having to go back and, and maybe think about something he said about something we've already discussed. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. Well, I think we can move forward. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's really not a us versus them. You, you know, the applicant it has you know, this and, and that and back and forth. But, you know, if we want to dismiss and come out, I'm fine with that. If we want to try to plug through a few of these, um, you know, we're not asking people to take a hard vote here tonight. We're just asking to see, you know, if it looks like the majority of the board wants to move forward on a certain item, granting the special permit or, or not. And and then after we decide that, then we we have to go through the next process. But um, I don't feel the need to get that information before we talk about it because I don't think it's really going to change anything. Um, we know there's people that aren't happy with it, but a lot of the concerns are outside of uh, our relevance. They're outside of us. They're, they, they, aren't, um, they aren't specific to what, what we're trying to do. And I think what we need to do is try to stay focused on, on one, the piece of property at hand, not what goes on at other properties, uh, not not about uh, those things. We, we have six things that we have to, we have to go over. And, you know, it's up to you, Mr. Chair, if you want to recess for tonight, but it's 815. Maybe we could get a half an hour's worth of work in on at least one item um, to know if, if there's some agreement on it. Alex, question, comments? You want to continue, Alex, or not? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Adam. I, I think we should try to make some sort of progress. Um, I, I'm glad that we moved forward and um, you know closed the public hearing. But I, I agree. I think uh, I think we should try to do a little bit more tonight and make some progress on the uh, six criteria. And then in that uh, in between now and the next meeting, we can uh, review any more 
uh, information and go from there, but I think we can keep going. Okay, Mr. Kaiser, just quick, a quick note. When we take a vote, I believe I have to wait before I declare the vote, and that allows people to make a change in their vote. Is that correct? The sure. vote is not official until I accept the vote. So if we take a straw vote, I have to wait a few minutes, and then we take another vote. I recall the vote and review the voters, and then, then we accept the vote either for or against, correct? Mr. Chair, there's, there's a difference between a straw poll and a vote. If okay. you take a straw poll, then the result of that straw poll is evident the moment that a member says yay or nay. It, it's not a vote, it's a poll. Okay. I was if you're taking an official vote, then generally once the vote is taken, the chair as a matter of course will declare the outcome of the vote, but that declaration can be made immediately. The, uh, an individual has no right to, to a few seconds to change their vote. They have to speak oh. up if they wanna change their vote or else. I, or else. Was, just, I was just <laughs> reviewing Robert's rules and I was trying to follow Robert's rules. If you say that's not the way it is, that's fine, but that's what I was going to do. But if you say no, then we'll do it that way. We'll do it the way you said to do it. Okay, let's get into discussion. We got a little bit of time here. Let's use it to iron out some of these things and it'll give us a chance to uh, review and review our, our comments. And I think it'll be helpful if we cover some of these, give us a chance to think so we come back again, we can make rational decisions. I think that's the way to proceed. Okay, let's, keep, let's continue. Anyone, 5321, comments. Mr. Sokolowski. <clears throat> Social, economic, or community needs, which are served by the proposal. Um, again, um, thinking of the applicant only as a retail store um, and thinking that um, not as a Dollar General, but as a store that's selling consumer goods as instructed by council, um, we have to think about um, what's available in town and what's not <laughs> available in town. And um, a retail store such as this has many goods that aren't available from any other locations in town. We also have to think about uh, the environment when we think about our own residents and we have to think about the information that people are stopping at this location are passed through traffic, they're not additional trips. And we're thinking about members of the community that may purchase um, something at a retail location like this instead of driving to Greenfield or Northampton. Um, I also, you know, think a lot about our elderly residents and um, mobile, people with mobility issues. Um, they, they may not want to transverse a large box store um, like Walmart or Target to find some of these consumer goods that would be um, here in our community that would be um, close, close by. Also, um, a lot of residents uh, reach an age in their life where they don't like to drive at night or in the dark. And uh, as you know, the days today are getting awfully short. So I think those are, are benefits um, that, that may, um, may help um, members of our community, um, as well as help our um, tax base with uh, sales tax and um, property tax. And, and it, you know, although uh, it is, you know, unfortunate that any piece of property gets, um, developed, you, you have to think that the community needs to um, have, have the ability to have places developed. We can't just turn the whole town into a uh, state park, uh, which would be maybe nice. I mean, the characters changed in my lifetime. And, um, you know, based on what, what this proposal is, <clears throat> it seems uh, to, be, to be fair um, for the size of the property in, in there. Um, that's my social economic um, view of, of, the, of the applicant's proposal. Okay, any other comments? Yeah, I have, I have some comments. Yeah, go ahead. John Staberski. I don't think the, app, uh, in, contra in contrast to what uh, Mr. Sokolowski has said, I don't think the applicant has demonstrated whatsoever that there is any social, economic, or community needs that are advantageous to the community. Uh, they gave no evidence whatsoever about any additional product choices that are not available in our town or in even within two or three miles away. <clears throat> if there were new and unique products that could be accessed uh, by this particular retail store, 
they might have made an argument. And I, I, I believe I asked that question during the hearing, what are, do we, what's going to be there that we don't have in South Deerfield already? And I, I don't think we got any straight answers uh, to, to that there was going to be additional products. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, this very same store or similar retail stores are, you know, in Greenfield within eight to 10 miles from our, from, from this facility. So it might save a few minutes of driving, but, you know, nearly all of our residents, particularly if they have to go grocery shopping uh, <clears throat> to a supermarket, have to go to a store that is similar, or has to go to a plaza where they have stores that are similar to these stores. So if you're going to go shopping at Big Y or Stop and Shop, or if you're going to go to Foster's in Greenfield, um, or to the Stop and Shop in Amherst, <clears throat> there are the same stores that offer these kinds of products. So I don't think the product selection gives is advantageous at all. Um, <clears throat> does a community, uh, is it needed for the community there? Well, my recollection of our master planning process is that we were going to try to keep commercial activity clustered uh, in the downtown area of South Deerfield. This is expanding a retail outlet kind of outside of South Deerfield. So it's kind of an opposite of our, uh, of our master plan. Um, <clears throat> so I would suggest that there are no pros, maybe no, maybe minimal pro with respect to elderly not having to go to Greenfield. Uh, but other than that, there are no pros on the, on the social, economic, and community needs that this particular proposal meets. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Decker. Having <laughs> grown up uh, in this town in the 60s and the 50s, uh, at one time, there were, I think, five grocery stores in the center of South Deerfield. Correct. There was a shoe store, a dry goods store, a cobbler, and there was many other things that were available to the general public. And over the course of time, uh, we're basically down to basically one limited grocery store and one uh, little bit of a deli and a little bit of groceries. But there's nobody that's selling uh, dry goods that I can re with any great amount. And I think it, it's, I think it'd be an asset to the community to have their products available. And uh, cause there are a lot of elderly people that don't want to drive to Greenfield any more often than they have to, uh, especially with the traffic and, and what have you. I was in Hadley the other night and somebody pulls out from the right lane and comes over into my right lane. I had had to go off to the side The people are, at night, or the elderly people are—they're scared to go out at night with these people the way they drive, and I—I uh, I just think it'd be a good thing for the town to see it in there. There are a lot, a lot of people. There's a lot of people opposed to it, but there's an awful lot of people that aren't saying a lot because they don't want to be uh, ostracized. But Bob, we don't know what products. We don't even know what they're going to offer. They haven't. They haven't. They haven't put that in evidence. John, you know what they're offering. You've been through the store and you've looked. Have you not been in the Dollar General and gone through and seen the products there? We're not supposed to be evaluating this as Dollar General. We're supposed to evaluate it as a retail store. Everybody and their brother has been through it. They're taking pictures of the delivery trucks. They're taking all this other stuff. Common sense is they've got a whole big, great, big, long product line. If you want the UPS codes, or not the UPS codes, but whatever the product codes, I'm sure they could have supplied it to you. So. Okay. Other comments? Okay, I want to make yes. a yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Potter, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'll wait. I want to go last. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, respond to some of what both uh, Adam and Bob were saying about um, um, product variety or um, uh, benefits and benefits to the elderly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think everybody knows we had a huge amount of public input. And um, I think that our job is to um, uh, 
you know, steward the public interest. And it's, it's, it's very hard to um, hear um, points made on behalf of benefits for Dollar General that Dollar General's attorney has not even made for them. And so I think that's John's point that they're not telling us that the products are any better or different than what's already available. So why are we making that assumption um, when, you know, for them, that, that, is, that is not an argument that they have made. Um, and we did not hear from elderly or really anyone that I recall except for Kip Kamosa, who came from the public and spoke of unnamed people who felt like he did. But Bob's here citing people who are in fear of ostracization. And, you know, that's just very hard to process. Uh, we're an open community. We have a public hearing. Everybody is entitled. They could have written letters, uh, you know, and retained some kind of anonymity. But the public citizenry, and particularly this neighborhood, did not speak to us in any significant way um, to vouch for the benefit that they might feel as elderly people or as people who want variety in their, um, uh, you know, local shopping um, uh, offerings. So I cannot see where there's been any actual benefit proposed by the Dollar General applicants that outweighs the concerns for detriments that seem real from the people who've spoken and, uh, and from our own information. Mr. Decker, you have another comment? I just, uh, I'm not going to sit here and defend it. Certain people had their minds made up before they got appointed to the board and what have you. Uh, it, I'm, I'm sick and tired of the bullshit, okay? People, people are not, don't like to come to public meetings because they're afraid of people complaining about them, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, so I've said what I'm going to say. As far as I'm concerned, the whole application is a positive thing for the town of Deerfield, and we should move forward. We've spent a year or better time on it, and these people have, have gone through an awful lot of extra work, and I don't think it was necessary to put them through all this stuff. So that's where I am, okay? Any other comments? Okay, I want to make a comment. John, you said you couldn't find anything. The other day, I was at a working in a house and the person told me they went to stop and shop looking for uh, the aluminum container, the aluminum pans that go underneath a stove. Could not find them. Guess where they found them? Guess where they found them? So when you say you can't find things, well, I have to give you an example of a person that couldn't find it anyone else, anywhere else but there. Now, I went, you know, maybe it's prejudice, but I went through and looked through three stores to see what they had in there. I brought my wife in there because those are the people that are going to look. And she said, there's a lot of things that we you know. Maybe you're gonna, I'm going to be prejudiced by saying this, but I'm not going to judge somebody unless they take a look at what they got there. And my wife said, there's a lot of things in here that I would buy. So when people say it's not available, well, that's your opinion. My opinion is different. My opinion is different, and I went in there, and I've had people tell me they got stuff in there that I would buy, and I don't want to ride through Greenfield because Greenfield's traffic. How do you get to Greenfield? You go through the center of town, or you go through the uh, section over there by the rotary. Those are not good places to drive. You cross by uh, Newton School over there, you take your life in your hands. We talk about 5 and 10. That's a mess over there, but that's the way it is. So they... They've provided things. I've looked at it, and there are things that people are going to buy. Now, whether they buy them or not, I don't know. In the store I was in, there was a woman with a shopping cart full of foods and other things. And I asked a question, why did you come here? She goes, because I got lower prices here than I have around me, and I don't have a lot of money to spend. So you brought it up about what could buy. I probably shouldn't have said anything. But you know what? I've listened to this. I've looked myself. I can only judge what I have seen, and that's what I'm going to judge by. So, so Bernie, my point is that the Dollar General is supposed to put that evidence in front of us, DG, the applicant. It's not for us to go out and make our own ascertainments of what they have 
and what they don't have. And we're not supposed to be looking at this as a dollar general. We're supposed to be looking at it as a retail out, outlet. And, they, and it's their obligation to put before us information as to why is they're gonna, there's going to be more products than what's available in Deerfield. The only thing they've said before us thus far is that competition will be good because we'll get better prices and things like that. They haven't demonstrated. They haven't put evidence before us. We're not supposed to go out and rely on, you know, third party, what they're saying about products and things like that. It's their obligation of, to prove this stuff to us. And, they ha and I'm suggesting that they haven't based upon their presentations to us. So that's my point. Okay, any other comments? Okay, we've covered that one. Uh, 553 uh, traffic flow safety, including parking and loading. Comments? Mr. Sokolowski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you talk louder, it doesn't do anything better on the computer. So just, you know. Okay. It, 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 I got fancy speakers here and, and, and you know, we can, we can take, the, take it down a notch. Um, so you're saying that we're moving on from, uh, I just, I do remember, um, and it was a long time ago, I think it was in January or February when, uh, the applicant went over their, um, product line. Uh, it was, it was an in-person meeting. So you might want to take a look at the notes on that. Uh, so we're moving on 5322, Mr. Correct. Chair. Traffic flow. Yeah. Traffic flow. So. Uh, there was a traffic study done uh, a while ago now, pre-COVID. Um, as we know, pre-COVID, uh, traffic <coughs> were much higher than they are now. Uh, we had the opportunity to review um, that traffic plan, uh, and it was peer-reviewed by the town's peer review company. Um, and, and they then have worked with uh, MassDOT to make some upgrades to that area. Um, in the town bylaw. So um, I do hear the public comments and concerns with the traffic flow from the time it was taken back in 2018. But when you apply uh, common sense to that time frame, we know now that um, the traffic flow might never get back to those 2018 levels because of the vast amount of people now working from home and uh, how long this COVID goes on. So although I do hear those concerns, I think back now at the validity of that study time being more traffic than, than's out there now. If you look at any of the um, Google data that's out that shows how much people are moving around, we're, we're still way below that. So I think delaying this project any further because of traffic issues would be negligible because um, I don't think that um, that we could we could also indicate what ifs down the road, but we are for sure knowing that they're going to create turning lanes there. They're creating more room for bicycle traffic, um, and they're creating better pavement markings. And their traffic flow has is is a ways north is not directly coming into that intersection in question. Um, so for me, um, I don't have any further concerns on their traffic flow and safety after reviewing the peer review documents and the, the documents that uh, were originally presented by the applicants and their ability to work with Mass DOT. Obviously, um, we're conditioning or would condition if approved that they have to uh, follow all the Mass DOT guidelines. So that's, that's where I am on, on traffic flow and safety. Uh, additional comments, please. Well, we're supposed to be evaluating the pros and the cons. And, and, uh, and the pros are, yes, that intersection will be improved. Um, dollar general, but there are cons as well that we have to weigh. And uh, uh, once again, this is a weighing process. Do the benefits outweigh the detriments? <clears throat> and the cons are that there will be a significant amount of stopping and stopping turning traffic uh, more kind of activity at the intersection um, we all know that that is a dangerous intersection those who travel it a lot 
As you know, I've been someone who's advocated for a crosswalk there or, uh, or uh, you know, a flashing light and, you know, something to be safer than it already is. I know I cross that a lot on my bike and it is scary and it is dangerous. I mean, we've had one significant accident there during our deliberations. <clears throat> so, you know, I think there are pros, but there are cons. And on each one of these, we need to balance. Um, and, and, uh, and I think we have, to, we have to also elucidate what the cons are if we're going to be fair and not just try to be, you know, advocative for, for one's position that, that the, the additional traffic, the trucks that are going in there, I mean, for, for the, uh, the documents that we received today um, showed that uh, the applicant uh, at least what's happening in Greenfield was not represented, uh, the, the truck traffic that they said was happening. I mean, there are three trucks, a Pex, I saw a Pepsi truck, a Coke truck, and a potato tr truck, truck, all waiting in the parking lot to unload at the Dollar General in Greenfield on Federal Street several days ago. <clears throat> that is not what was represented to us. Um, so, you know, I think the, the, there is a potential that the activity there is, is more than, than what was told to us. And, and I think that's a potential con uh, on the con side for this. Other comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Decker. I think the proposal that the developer has presented with the turn lanes, et cetera, are, is very good and it's very positive. And I mentioned before, that I really think a roundabout would be the right thing that the state should be putting in and doing it in slowing down the traffic on the whole corridor. But nevertheless, what the developer is proposing is very positive compared to what it is today. That's all I got to say. Anyone else? Yes. No one else? Yeah, I. Any... Yes, Alex? Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I do think the improvements that are proposed by the applicant are an improvement. Um, though I, I do also agree that um, more traffic is going to cause more problems. But um, I think we need to sort of think of this as or consider this as an opportunity to start thinking more long term. Um, you know, maybe if the uh, applicant puts these traffic um, measures in place, maybe the state will say, oh, okay, well, if we're going to start doing these types of uh, improvements. Well, why don't we continue on five and 10? Why don't we, um, I, I don't know what the state's plan is in terms of upgrading route five and 10 in terms of complete streets. I mean, who knows in 10 years, it might be a completely different um, atmosphere when you're driving. Um, and I also think, I guess this is sort of going with the, um, the first criteria, um, I should have said it earlier. Um, again, I think this may be an opportunity that, um, you know, we can start looking at uh, the whole corridor in general. Um, I mean, if it's zone commercial and that treehouse brewing is coming in, um, how can we link those two together? How can we... Um, you know, improve the entire corridor. Um, I don't know. I just, um, I definitely do see both sides, um, but I think we need to look further in the future um, and maybe uh, try to combine some of these things and look at them together instead of just uh, singularly. Other comments? Mr. Potter. Yes, um, speaking directly to Alex's point, um, people have taken the time to think into the future, Alex, and they've said that these kinds of buildings, uh, by and large, are not what we want. So now you're sort of trying to uh, turn around what has been um, an important uh, piece of planning. Um, and, and um, you know, the reason these limitations were put in um, were just because of a very different notion of planning and uh, development. Um, so, 
you know, I kind of think that, you know, you're, you're also projecting into a future and, and trying to compare and um, assess based on a lot of unknowns when that's not really our job. Um, we're, we're, we're here to decide what, what it looks like right now. Um, and, um, um, and, you know, in, in essence, our job is the opposite of what you're saying is, is our job is to try to fit this within um, the planning that has already been expressed prior to us um, and that we're supposed to try to uh, keep things in line with. Um, and, um, you know, uh, just to finish off with talking about the, um, the, the traffic flow and safety, I think it's undeniable that, that the road will be improved with this project, um, but it's also undeniable that traffic will be increased in truck traffic um, and, and, the, and the parking and loading are going to be impactful on the, the, the microcosm of the neighborhood itself. And we're charged with thinking equally of the town and the neighborhood. Um, and uh, I think that it's a very tough call as to whether the obvious improvement on five and 10 really outweighs some of the increase in traffic um, and, the, and the loading and parking issues uh, that could create congestion and inconvenience to the neighborhood. Other comments? Okay, I'm going to address the issue of unloading and loading. In my purview of these places, I was watching them drive in, back up, and unload at a dollar general. So if we're going to be talking about what they're going to be doing, I watched what went on, and I didn't see a problem. I was there. Now, I know we're not supposed to be looking, but you know what? I'm not going to look at pictures that somebody snaps because I can find a million things wrong no matter what I do if I wait for the right moment. I can take bicyclists not following the law when there are five people widen the road. Does that mean every bicyclist is going to do that? No. So if I'm taking snapshot pictures of stuff, which seems to be going on, and there's going to be another reference to this later on, when I checked on stuff, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but you know what? I think it's my civic responsibility to make a judgment on my knowledge, not on what somebody tells me. And that, unfortunately, people might not agree with that. However, that's what I've done. Uh, you can take my words and you can say, he's wrong. That's fine. I understand that. But I'm stating my opinion of what I saw and watch this go on. Mr. Staberski, I know you're going to have a comment for me. No, I'm, you said what you need to say. Okay. Any, uh, anyone else? Okay, we've got that covered. Adequacy of utilities and public services, 5323. Comments? Mr. Sokolowski. Well, I don't know how we're going in order. I have my notes prepared. We can, I can go last. I, I, you know. We went for a free for all, I thought. Well, I thought we were only going a quarter or nine. Okay. About okay. My well, crib. Okay. We'll stop. I'm fine. We could go for another 15 minutes. That's up to you, Mr. Uh, Chair. You're, you're running the meeting here. I'm just trying to things. do my best. Do you want to finish this one and then? Yes. Let's finish save, this one. So we're save, halfway through. Yeah. Save, th save three for next time. Yeah. All right. Hang on a minute. I got to get to my other screen here. Uh, I, I can, if he's, if he's going go and looking ahead, at John, John, Go I ahead, John. You can I go. can make some comments. <clears throat> I don't think there are uh, significant issues, either pros or cons, with the adequacy of utilities. <clears throat> yeah, I, think, I agree, John. Yeah. I think I think it's a wash. I don't think there's anything there. Other public services, you know, the only thing that I would think public services that we haven't thought of is that there's a bus that comes down from Greenfield that stops at different places, you know. <clears throat> If this is a place where people need goods and services, it would be interesting to see whether there could be some sort of public transportation there. But <clears throat> that's that's the only public service interest that it really hasn't been addressed at all. But I don't think there's any pros or cons with utilities or public services, but for you know the access to people who can't don't have cars. Yes, Adam. Yeah, if John's finished, I got my notes back up on the screen. It's just trying, yeah. it's trying hard to um, move into Mac, and I don't know. It's 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 <laughs> it's a little different. But so, anyways, um, based on that, 
Um, I do remember Mr. Donahue uh, addressing this at the first meeting, and um, I agree that there's uh, they're handling all that, the power on site. I would just like to say that um, it uh, it should be a limited impact, if if no other uh, impact on utilities or public services, because they're. Um, there wouldn't be a lot of people. There's not a lot of res. There's no resonance there. Um, it's just, you know, basically them keeping their, their lights on and, and, and heat in the place. So that's all I have. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Decker. Yes. <laughs> to Mr. Stabersky's, uh comment relative to the bus transportation. Do you want me to inquire about a bus stop being put in there? I can take care of that. There's a board meeting next week of the RT FRTA. Are you on the FRTA? Yes, I have been for 20 odd years. Well. So if yeah. you want a bus stop there, we can take care of that. Okay. Uh, they used to go down North Main Street until the bridge, uh, some people objected to the bridge being rebuilt. I wouldn't know who it was, but the bridge didn't get rebuilt and therefore it doesn't meet the weight limit. So the bus has to go down, down route five. And, but I'm pretty sure we can get a bus stop there. If you want one there. Any other comments? I agree. I agree. If we're talking about elderly people and being able to access this, we would, it would really be an advantageous situation where, where people could get there who might have a disability or don't want to drive. I, I think that's a fantastic idea. I never thought of that, John. Well, the problem is that the applicant, and we are, it's not our duty to go look, to go search, to give ideas, but they have not put forward any proposal for a bus stop. They haven't done any drawings. They'd have to modify the roads. You're not going to pull over a bus on 5 and 10. you got to create a bus stop. It, if there was going to be some public services, that infrastructure investigation should have should be part of this and it and, and it just it, it, the the applicant didn't put anything together for us to think about a review so if i were to think there's a if there are pros and cons it's probably a con because the applicant didn't seek out mr decker and the frta and make appropriate kind of planning for bus stops because this is a place, if, it ever, if this were to be approved by this board, this is a place that people who don't have cars probably would use. I agree. Uh, the, uh, Alex, the, I think you had, no, Jen, you had your hand up, I think. That's in it's Alex and then it's, Dave, I think. <clears throat> David Potter just had his hand up on the screen. Okay. So. All right, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, go uh, ahead. I would just agree uh, completely with what John was saying there. Uh, I think that speaking about a bus stop, a potential bus stop is way out of line. It's way out of turn. It's not our purview to project what, um, you know, uh, is not real. It's not here. And it is not something that they thought of and that they proposed. It's not part of their plan. So it should not really be considered. And it really seems um, inconsistent with how they thought of the intersection. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, you're next. I just had a quick point. I, I mean, if if it's the if some if blah, 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 if the board feels that they should have a, a bus stop, is it something that uh, the planning board could look at since they're still in site plan review? Um, I'm not sure. Just just a sort of general question. Mr. Costa, comment from Mr. Costa. Mr. Chairman, I. I Certainly, board members as residents are, are free, as, a, as is the public generally, to make whatever request they choose of the planning board. I, I can't speak for what the planning board will or won't do. I can tell you that the matter that's been the planning board is on remand to the planning board following settlement discussions. So I think that the planning board's uh, uh, purview is even more limited than it would otherwise be for site plan approval. With that said, you know, if the board, and I'm not suggesting this is the case or not, but if the board were inclined to approve the project, and this was something that was discussed uh, further as part of deliberations and as part of crafting a, an approval decision, you could decide for yourselves whether you wanted to condition the decision to 
require certain things of the applicant. Um, because the public hearing is closed, you don't now have the opportunity to engage in a dialogue with the applicant about whether this is something that they think they can do. So we'd have to have a careful conversation about what you can commit, obligate the developer or the applicant to do versus what you can um, suggest that the applicant do. Um, but it, it is something you could consider as part of your decision if the decision is to approve the project. Obviously, if you deny the project, it's a non-issue. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? We're done with our three. Uh, it's nine o'clock. Do uh, I have a motion, Mr. Sokolowski? Yeah, I, I would uh, make the motion to adjourn and um, to reconvene on the second uh, Thursday of December. Um, and I just want to, you know, if do we want to start at six on this hearing? Um, that's convert a convenient time for everybody, and then I can put that in a formal motion. Let's have a kind of a little straw vote here. Does that sound right to everybody? I'm seeing heads knocking. Okay, all right, okay. So uh, put that in your. Proposal okay, I make here. a motion that we uh, adjourn the deliberation uh, on this hearing and reconvene for deliberation on this hearing at uh, 6 p.m. on the second Thursday of December 2020, which would be uh, December 10th. I second it. Second it. Okay, let's take a quick, well, I, we have to take a vote on this, don't we? Yes, we do. Adam, yes? Yeah. Adam, Give it. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Well, Decker. Mr. Potter second the motion. He's not voting on this issue tonight. Okay. I'm still you, in the you discussion. Have, you have to have a second from a board member who's actually qualified to vote in this hearing this evening. Okay. I'm sorry for Mr. Potter because I did not declare who was going to vote on this and I didn't until we went to this That's okay. voting. Is that, is that correct, Mr. Costa, that we, you and I discussed this and we're not going to take and give out the voting members until the discussion has ended. Am I correct? Well, I think that now that we're in deliberations, um, Mr. Chairman, my, my point to you before was You've always got to be cautious about um, while the public hearing is open for sure when you designate members because members could miss a future session after you've designated who you intend to be the, the members and then disqualify themselves. But with the public hearing now closed, we know who is present for the public hearing. And if you've got sufficient voting members, that can be declared at any time. I thought it was declared when we closed it today. I thought so too. Yeah, I, Bernie, yeah, Bernie, you declared that already today it earlier. Yeah, you declared that Alex was a voting member. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Because I, yes. I, missed, I missed the discussion. So you, the, the proposal is to continue or I guess uh, adjourn and, and reconvene for few further deliberations on what date? The 10th? Yeah. It'll be the second Thursday of uh, my motion was for the second Thursday of December uh, 2020, which I believe is the 10th of my if I'm lining up correctly at 6 p.m. Is that correct, Mr. Costa? Th that's correct. And the reason I asked the question is I have a prior commitment that evening. Um, I believe my commitment will be at seven o'clock. So if you want me to be part of those deliberations, which you know I, I don't wanna tell you how to do your jobs, but um, I think this is probably where I do my most important work if we're working toward a decision, uh, I'd ask for either consideration of a different date or trying to structure the time if you've got other matters on that night so that I can come early or come late. Well, I could, uh, I can rescind my motion and, and make another one. Uh, John, I know you have the, what time is, is the earliest that you want to start, John? Really six o'clock, uh, given my commitments. Well, maybe we could work on it for just an hour. And then, uh, and then uh, if, if we're at a point, we can then reconvene in January. We have 90 days or should we, should we try for another night, Mr. Costa? You certainly have time. Um, so it, I, I leave it to the board's discretion when to meet. I can be flexible. I just happen to have a commitment that's been on the books for several weeks and uh, it's in another community and I can't change it. Can we move it earlier a week? That was my nice. work for me, uh, not on Thursday anyways. It would be, uh, I could do the first Wednesday, the second, That's okay with me. That's John, fine. John, is that all right with you? Okay. John's looking. 
can we do it the third, uh, the Thursday? The, the... No, that does not work for me. The okay. first Thursday of the month, I always have a meeting. I could do Wednesday that week, the ninth. That would work for me. Okay, Mr. Decker. Works for me. Mr. Alex. Yes. <laughs> yes, it works for me. So let's now. Does that work for town hall? Jen? Yeah, it looks like I was going to say that the um, the third did not, or the second did not look good. So um, the ninth, um, let's see, sorry. One. Are we going to do a remote or are we going to do it in person? It's we don't know. Remote. <laughs> sorry, remote. Um, right. Yeah, we can make it. Okay, I'll make a motion that we convene, we adjourn to reconvene on the 9th of December, 2020 at 6 p.m. to continue this hearing. Seconded. Second, okay, I'm just gonna make a quick statement. I have this one is... more thing, Bernie. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, this. let's vote on this and end this uh, what we're doing if your comment's not related to, to, to this, if it's general. It's a general comment, so let's vote on this. Okay. Okay. Do but I have a vote be, to... But our, but our meeting will be closed if we vote on it. Oh, no. No, 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 not our meeting, this hearing. We're, we're mo we're, my motion is to close, close the hearing. The, oh, end the hearing. Or close, adjourn the hearing today to reconvene right. the hearing on the 9th of December at 6 p.m. And that's been <laughs> seconded by Mr. Decker. And, and I, I, I apologize for interjecting, so, but I want to be sure that any members of the public who are still listening are not, um, uh, are not misdirected. Um, you're not closing the hearing. The hearing no. was closed about an hour ago. That's right. We're All you're doing is you are, you are adjourning this item on your agenda to reconvene on the 9th to continue deliberations. Correct. That's correct. I'll, you want me to restate the motion again, Mr. Costa, to be clear? I think that's fine. Okay. Okay. Alex, motion, are you approved of us changing and moving and closing? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> John? Yes. Okay. Uh, Adam? Yes. And Mr. Decker? Yes. Okay, and I approve. Okay, just a quick, so adopted, we're closed. We're in, we're we're on the general business, Bernie. We're just continuing it. We're on general business. We're on general business. Okay, I just want to thank everybody. This has been a long process. Well, I, I have know another question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to clear this up while everybody's here so we can get out of here. Okay. Make sure you tell the town hall if we're going to have other business on Wednesday night, the 9th, or if they have to push everybody off, or if we're going to eat meet, meet again on Thursday so they know in advance before things get posted in the newspaper. Okay. All right. What, does the board want to meet two nights in a row or no. do, do other stuff after? No, that's what I'm so. trying to ask here. You guys want to meet two nights in a row? That's fine to space, to space it out. That's okay. But I'm, I would, either way is fine. No this, difference to me, John. Fine. I'm fine with it. Mr. Decker. In a row. Okay. What's that, John? I'm good with meeting two nights in a row. I, I had, okay. I had the, uh, I had the, uh, the, 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 Tenth or the uh, yeah the tenth already blocked out so so if there's other business that we don't need Mr. Costa for then we're going to have a meeting on the tenth as well. That's what I was going to say that we get you know if we don't get to do it the ninth now we go to the tenth you're not here. Well, we're not. Adam Costa is not available the tenth either. That doesn't mean it can't go on. Well, well I'm available on the tenth. I'm not available the week before. Mr. Cost is not available on the tenth. He's only available for an hour earlier. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. But we would have to make that decision tonight too, because it has to be posted in advance. We can't meet on Thursday, on Wednesday night, and then say, "Oh, we're going to meet again tomorrow and address Dollar General." Then that wouldn't be on the agenda. I think we need to keep the agenda clear until we get this straightened out. I don't think any of this stuff is that pressing. Well, we just said we we're going to take up other matters on Thursday night. Yes, that's right. But we're okay. If that's what you want to do. I don't have a problem with that. That's what the board wants to do. I don't have a problem with it. Looks like we're all in agreement. So that's what we're going to do. 
Okay. What else did you want to do, Bernie, tonight? I just wanted to bring up the comment that um, this has been a trying situation for all of us. There's a lot of information. There's a lot. There's lots of points of view, pro and con. Uh, we've all went through this. You know, we're we're trying to do the best we can. We've had tremendous support, and you know, I think they go and recognize that our town office people have done a tremendous amount of hours in there doing this, and the people are short on us because we're not getting stuff down there. But it's it's been difficult. It's been difficult, and I applaud the board for putting up with what you put up with and trying to make the right decisions. We all have different points of view and respecting other points of view, which is important. Um, I commend everybody that, that has spent this time and really done a good job in, in doing this. Uh, we may not hear that from the public, but you're going to hear it from me. I commend everyone here, whether no matter how this vote goes, we've done a great job. We've spent a lot of time in here. And it's not been easy. Thank you, Mr. Costa. Thank board members. Uh, we'll see you. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion, Second. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. We don't have to take a vote, do we? Yeah, I see a straw vote. It's roll call again. Roll call. Oh, cool. Here Adam Sikloski, yes. Uh, Adam. Alex. Yes. Bob yes. John. Yes. Adam, I'm sorry, Adam Costa, so I'm getting the names all confused. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you in um, three weeks. Thank you, and good night.